Mr. President. The Senator from Louisiana. Madam President, I'm sorry. The Senate will be in order. The Senator from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. As my colleagues know, we have about 41,000 active duty service members of the United States Coast Guard. They're running vital missions right now, Madam President, in the South China Sea. They're protecting our airspace and ports along about 12,000 miles of coastline. They're performing search and rescue missions. That includes uh, nearly 1,200 active duty Coast Guard personnel in my home state of Louisiana, the 8th Coast Guard District. The Senate will be in order so we can hear from the Senator from Louisiana. Please take your conversations off the floor. I would, I would reiterate this, this. that the Senate is not in order and the Senator from Louisiana deserves to be heard on this important matter. The gentleman so I would is continue correct. to make that point of order. The Senate will be in order. <laughs> Members are asked to take your conversations off the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the senior senator from Mississippi. Um, uh, Madam President, for that reason, I think I'm, the members of our Coast Guard need to be paid during this shutdown until we resolve our differences. We need to resolve our differences. There are some good members of Congress, but right now the American people are wondering what they're good for. And it seems to me that we ought to be able to reach an agreement that secures the border, which I happen to believe can't be done without a barrier and which also opens government. And for that reason, Madam President, I ask for unanimous consent that the Coast Guard be paid, that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar number six, H.J. Res. 1, that the Wicker Amendment at the desk be agreed to, that the bill is amended, be considered, read a third time and passed, and the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Um, Madam President. Democratic leader. Reserving the right to object, President Trump is responsible not only for thousands of Coast Guard personnel not getting paid, but hundreds of thousands of other, other federal employees also not getting paid. Last week, I met with the Coast Guard Commandant, Commandant Schultz, and I told him to press Secretary Nielsen, who could press the President, to stop holding innocent federal employees hostage in wall negotiations. Now, last month, as we all know, the Senate voted unanimously, unanimously, to keep the government open into February so all federal employees get paid, and the President and Congress can separately negotiate border security. Today, the Senate will again have a chance to vote on the same measure that we passed unanimously in December. I expect that those who care about getting our Coast Guard paid will support passing H.J. Res. 31, a continuing resolution for the Department of Homeland Security and H.R. 648, which are the conference bills for FSGG, Interior Environment, Agriculture, THUD, SFOPS, and CJS. So, Mr. President, would the Senator from Louisiana modify his request to include the unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of H.J. Res. 648 and H.J. Res. 31 on block that the measure be considered read a third time and passed on block, and the motions to reconsider be made and laid upon the table with no action or debate, that will pay all federal employees who deserve to be paid. Madam President. Does the Senator so modify his request? Madam President, reserving the right to object. I'm, I'm smiling because of the great admiration and respect I have for the senior senator from New York. I love to hear him talk. The senator will yield. It is I'm, mutual. I love to hear him talk. Um, 
He can talk the ears off a jackrabbit. Um, he, uh, he, is, uh, he, he has waxed eloquently many times in this chamber. I remember back in uh, 2005, 2006, Senator, I was a mere lad. But we had a bill before this chamber called the Secure Fence Act of 2006. And uh, Senator Schumer and then Senator, a rising star, Senator Obama, Senator Hillary Clinton, talked passionately and eloquently about how it was impossible to secure a 1,900-mile piece of real estate without barriers. They talked eloquently. I remember agreeing with them wholeheartedly that legal immigration makes our country stronger that illegal immigration undermines legal immigration, and that one way to stop illegal immigration, not the only way, Madam President, but one way was a border barrier. That was then. This is now. Now, my esteemed colleague knows full well that his resolution will not accomplish either border security or opening up of this government because President Donald Trump is going to veto it. It will be a futile, useless exercise. Now, you, we can go through it if you want to. You can spend all day trying to teach a goat how to climb a tree, but you're better off hiring a squirrel in the first place. And there is a measure before this Senate. The President has put a proposal on the table that will satisfy many of the concerns of our Democratic friends and ensure border security. And for that reason, I object. I wonder Mr. if the Objection distinguished Democratic leader would yield under his uh, reservation. Is, is there objection to, to the original request? I object to the original request because the senator from Louisiana has not allowed the rest of the federal government to get paid. And I would remind him, whether it's squirrel, jackrabbit, or armadillo, that we are the Article I branch of government. And because President Trump says no, we have veto override power, we could get the workers paid, even if he won't sign it. I object. Madam President, the objection I was, is heard. I, I was going to. Senator from Mississippi. I was going to ask the distinguished Democratic leader if he would yield under, uh, under his reservation. Uh, might I be recognized for just a moment? Uh, the, the objection has already been heard. And, and we'll not get this done. But I appreciate the effort. Does the senator from Louisiana yield the floor? Of course. Senator from Louisiana. I appreciate the effort of, of the distinguished senator from Louisiana. His unanimous consent request would have done one simple thing, and that is get the uniformed service members in the Coast Guard paid just like we are today paying for members of the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine. These are the only servicemen, the Coast Guard members are the only servicemen out there now who are required under the Uniform Code of Military Justice to perform their duties under pain of, uh, of uh, penalty, and they're not being paid as the others are. It would also uh, protect survivors' benefits for the retirees and, uh, and their survivors in the Coast Guard as is being done with the other uniformed services. We're close, we're, we may be getting close to a solution on this. I certainly hope so, Madam President. But in the meantime, I think it would be a significant gesture on the part of Democrats and Republicans in this Senate and in the House of Representatives to pass this one small change which the president has said he will sign and do the right thing by paying members of this uniform service. So I regret that the gentleman has uh, objected, and I appreciate uh, uh, having a chance at least to, to explain why this mere carve-out is different from, uh, from a larger solution, which may be coming soon. Madam Thank President, you, Madam Democratic. I would Democratic simply leader. once again remind my dear friend from Mississippi, we could do a whole lot more good by funding and opening up the government for everyone, and we should not, because President Trump 
who has claimed he wants to shut down the government for his wall 25 times and got this chamber to reverse itself when they had originally passed funding the whole government, we could do a lot more good if, we, if my amendment to my friend from Louisiana was adopted. And that's how it is. So now, on a different issue, I ask for the yeas and nays on the motion to proceed to S1. Is there a, is there a sufficient second? <coughs> There is a sufficient second. The yeas, the yeas and nays are ordered. Madam President, M Madam President, I, I ask Senator unanimous cons <coughs> Okay. Mad Madam President. Senator from Alaska. Madam President, I just want to explain a little bit of what, what we witnessed here on the Senate floor. It actually can be a little bit confusing, but it's, uh, it's an important issue. Here, with regard to the Coast Guard, my colleague from Louisiana and Mississippi, we've been working on this issue for a while. It's not going to solve the whole partial government shutdown, but we've been working with a number of uh, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. So right now, this bill that my friend from Louisiana asked to have unanimous consent on, um, right now has 23 co-sponsors, it might be more, actually more Democrat co-sponsors than Republican. Madam President, can, can you uh, make sure the Senate's in order? Senate will be in order. So almost, 20, almost a quarter of the whole Senate, more Democrat co-sponsors than Republican co-sponsors, are co-sponsoring this bill to pay the Coast Guard. Now, again, we're working on the broader issue of getting our government back to work, paying federal workers, but as my colleagues mentioned, the Coast Guard is a rather unique situation because it's the only military service right now that's not getting paid. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, they're all getting paid. The Coast Guard men and women are out right now as we speak in my great state in Alaska risking their lives for Americans as they always do, but they're also out in other places like the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf, literally running patrols in the Gulf side by side with Marines and sailors. The Marines and sailors are getting paid. The members of the Coast Guard aren't getting paid. And by the way, if the members of the Coast Guard say, you know what, I don't want to deploy to the Middle East right now, I'm not getting paid. I don't want to get on that ship to save an Alaskan crabber whose life is at risk. They get court-martialed. So the Coast Guard is, a very unique, is in a very unique situation right now, Madam President. And here's the process that we just witnessed. So a number of us, again, very bipartisan, went to the President and said, Mr. President, we know it takes the Senate and the House and the White House to pass a bill. People are working on the broader issue. We're all working on the broader issue, the compromises we need. Hopefully we can get there this afternoon. But in the meantime, in the meantime, let's try to get something where we have almost a quarter of the Senate in agreement, more Democrats than Republicans on this bill that Senator Kennedy just mentioned to pass. Would you support this? So a number of us had ongoing conversations with the President of the United States. I, uh, have raised this a number of times with him and his administration over the last two weeks. And in a meeting I had with him on Wednesday, he said, I'm 100% behind that bill. Okay, that's really important. Because some of what the minority leader said, we should be bringing up, the White House said, we're not going to support that. Okay, that's difficult to pass a bill when you're not going to get the president to sign it. But the president will sign this bill. In almost 25% of the Senate has said they're already co-sponsors of this bill. So what just happened, for everybody watching, particularly the Coast Guard members, when I learned that the President was supportive last Thursday, we brought up this bill to the Senate floor and we hotlined it. That meant we're trying to move it through the Senate very quickly. Every Republican um, cleared that hotline, essentially meaning we all voted yes. When we brought it over to our colleagues on the other side, and look, I know my colleagues care a lot about the Coast Guard, Democrats, Republicans. When we brought it over, it was stalled. 
So we kept asking, come on, don't you want to support this? you got a bunch of co-sponsors. The men and women of the Coast Guard are very unique right now in terms of the military not getting paid. And um, there was just a delay. So what Senator Kennedy did is he said, I'm going to live, ask for live unanimous consent. Let's just bring it up and pass it. And pass it. The White House would sign it. We could fix this issue today. I bet, most of the, I bet most of the House would certainly vote for it. So what he did, he brought it up for unanimous consent, and the minority leader objected. Now, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle like to talk a lot about hostage taking with regard to federal employees. Well, I think they need to think a little hard about what just happened with regard to the men and women of the Coast Guard. Because right now, you heard it from the minority leader. He said he's not going to do anything for the Coast Guard, even though the president would sign it. We could fix this tonight because of the broader issue. Now, here's the point. We are all working on the broader issue. And we're going to vote on some things. And if they fail this afternoon, I'm, there's a number of us who are working on compromises to fix this whole problem. But in the meantime, Madam President, in the meantime, why shouldn't we all be working on an important issue, it might not be the whole government, an important issue to take care of the men and women of the Coast Guard, people who are literally risking their lives right now for Americans, not just in Alaska or Texas, all over the world, and they're the only members of the military not getting paid. We could fix it tonight. The president will sign it as we're working on the broader issue. I don't understand why that is not an acceptable path forward in talking to the men and women of the Coast Guard, certainly in my state, they don't understand either. Yes, we've got to come to a compromise on this broader issue that ends the partial government shutdown, gets our federal workers, all of them, back, secures our border, and we're all working on that. But in the meantime, had the minority leader of the United States Senate not objected, Everybody here, I guarantee you, my Democratic colleagues would have voted for this bill to pay the Coast Guard. Just doesn't make sense, Madam President, and I certainly hope my colleagues and my good friend from New York will uh, reconsider their blocking of this bill because we could fix at least one, one element of this. And we need to fix it all, but in my view, a very unique element. Men and women who, who raise their hand to support and defend the Constitution and possibly die for this country are not getting paid, and yet the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines are. Let's fix it tonight. We can fix it tonight. Unfortunately, we just had an objection to doing that. I think it's a mistake, and I'm hopeful that my colleagues will reconsider it. Madam President. Senator from Texas. Madam President, I rise to strongly support the Senator from Alaska and the Senator from Louisiana and the Senator from Mississippi. We should pay our Post Guard. It is not right that we aren't paying the Coast Guard. Right now, every other military branch is being paid. The Army's being paid, the Navy's being paid, the Air Force is being paid, the Marines are being paid, but the Coast Guard is not being paid, even as they're risking their lives. Many of us in Texas and along the Gulf Coast saw the incredible heroism of the Coast Guard in the wake of Hurricane Harvey, where so many brave men and women risked their lives to save thousands upon thousands of innocents. They should be paid. And Madam President, I think it's important for the American people to understand what just happened here because it is highly consequential. It is easy for things to get lost in procedural gobbledygook. To assume, well, this is some back and forth about the shutdown, about the wall, has nothing to do with any of that. What Senator Kennedy asked, he brought forward a bill to pay the Coast Guard. It did nothing else. Didn't address any aspect of the shutdown, didn't address any aspect of the wall. It simply said, let's pay the men and women of the Coast Guard, yes or no. That means you can be a yes on that whether you think we need to secure the border and have a steel barrier or whether you support open borders, it doesn't say anything either way. It just says the men and women of the Coast Guard deserve paychecks. 
We could have passed that right here today, and there's one reason and one reason only we didn't, because the Democratic leaders stood up and said, I object. And I would note that if there are Democrats on the Democratic side of the aisle that are not comfortable with that, who agree that the Coast Guard should be paid, let me encourage my Democratic colleagues to say so because it is their party's leader who has lodged an objection on behalf of effectively every Democratic senator. And what they are doing, the Democrats are fond of using the phrase hostage taking. They are quite literally holding the men and women of the Coast Guard hostage because they want to win a political victory against the president. Their objective here is have the president back down and have not a single mile of border wall built. Never mind that the Democratic leader and every Democrat in this chamber in 2013 voted to build and fund 350 miles of border wall. 350 miles every Democrat in this chamber voted for. We're in a shutdown today because they are now unwilling to fund 234 miles of border wall, less than they voted for in 2013. Now, we understand politics rears its head in this business, and the Democrats want to defeat the president politically, and so the substance is secondary to trying to get that partisan victory over the president. But let me suggest this ought to be an issue. We can keep fighting back and forth on whether securing the border or having open borders is a good idea. But this ought to be an issue that should be real simple. Senator Kennedy brought forward a clean bill that does one thing and one thing only. It pays the salaries of the Coast Guard. If the Democratic leader hadn't objected, that would have passed right now. The president could have signed it tonight. The paychecks could have gone out right now for every man and woman in the Coast Guard. So if you're serving in the Coast Guard, in any of our 50 states, let me say, number one, thank you for your service. Thank you for your heroism. Thank you for the amazing difference you make. You deserve to be paid. You will be paid. But if you want to know why you weren't paid, it is because the Democratic leader objected to your getting a paycheck. It is my hope that the Democratic senators will go to their leader and say, this is a bad idea for Democratic senators to hold hostage the paychecks of the men and women of the Coast Guard. We should pay the Coast Guard, and that ought to be something that commands unanimous bipartisan support. I yield the floor. Madam President. Madam President. Senator from Alaska. Madam President, just uh, to, to make one other point, after the eloquent comments of my good friend from Texas, we've already done something similar here. So again, my plea to my colleagues, we're all breaking for lunch right now. My Democratic colleagues are going to go do their strategy session, and we're doing the same. I would implore them to go back to their leader and say, hey, come on, let's, let's rethink this. Because here's why. We've already done something similar. I was on the floor when two of my Democratic colleagues from Virginia asked for unanimous consent on a bill. Now remember, the, the, the whole government was partially shut down. There was a partial government shutdown. They had asked for unanimous consent on a bill to make sure that when the partial government shutdown was over, that everybody would receive back pay. So we're actually doing work on smaller but very important issues I was on the floor when they did that. I certainly voted yes. And by the way, that went to the president. He said he was going to sign it, and he signed it. So that became a law just about two weeks ago as we've been debating and trying to find compromise. So the notion that we're not doing any work, that we're not passing any laws that are impacting federal workers until the whole thing is over, that's actually not true. We've already done it. So this would be analogous to what we did two weeks ago. And that was led by the Democrats. And the thing about this Coast Guard bill right now is very, very bipartisan. Would the senator from Alaska yield for a question? Yes. Did the bill that Senator Kennedy brought forward do anything 
anything else beyond simply pay the men and women of the Coast Guard? No, it just made it so there was parity between the brave men and women in the Coast Guard and the brave men and women in the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, all of whom are risking their lives for our country and our citizens right now. Men and women of the Coast Guard are the only ones not getting paid. And so if the Democrats had not objected and it had passed, and the House passed it and sent to the President, could, could we get the men and women of the Coast Guard paid right now, today, get that passed into law? I think we, as soon as possible, we could get it passed. And I talked to the President on Wednesday, he said he was 100% behind this bill, the way he was behind that other bill, to, to provide back pay to everybody else who uh, has been affected by the partial government shutdown. So the only thing that is necessary to pass a clean bill paying the salaries of every man and woman in the Coast Guard is for the Democratic senators to withdraw their objection. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Madam President. Senator from Colorado. Madam President, I seldom, um, as you know, uh, rise on this floor to contradict somebody on the other side. I've worked very hard over the years to work in a bipartisan way with the presiding officer, with my Republican colleagues. but. These crocodile tears that the senator from Texas is crying for first responders are too hard for me to take. They're too hard for me to take. Because when, you sh when the senator from Texas shut this government down in 2013, my state was flooded. It was underwater. People were killed. People's houses were destroyed. Their small businesses were ruined. Forever. And because of the senator from Texas, this government was shut down for politics. Then he surfed to a second place finish in the Iowa caucuses. But we're of no help to the first responders, to the teachers, to the students whose schools were closed with the federal government that was shut down because of the junior senator from Texas. Now, it's his business, not my business, why he supports a president who wants to erect a medieval barrier on the border of Texas, who wants to use eminent domain to build that wall, who wants to declare an unconstitutional emergency to build that wall. That's the business of the senator from Texas. I can assure you that in Colorado, if a president said he was going to use eminent domain to erect a barrier across the state of Colorado, across the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, he was going to steal the property of our farmers and ranchers to build his medieval wall, there wouldn't be an elected leader from our state that would support that idea, which goes to my final point, how ludicrous it is that this government is shut down over a promise the President of the United States couldn't keep, and that America is not interested in having him keep. This idea that he was going to build a medieval wall across the southern border of Texas take it from the farmers and ranchers that were there and have the Mexicans pay for it isn't true. That's why we're here. Because he's now saying the taxpayers have to pay for it. That's not what he said during his campaign. Over and over and over and over again, he said the Mex Mexico would pay for the wall. Over and over again. That was that. I was going to talk about what he said about the junior senator's father, but I'm going to let that alone. It was after that. And now we're here with the government shut down over his broken promise while the Chinese are landing spacecraft on the dark side of the moon. That's what they're doing. Not to mention what they're doing in Latin America and with their One Belt, One Road initiative in, in, in Asia. That's what they're doing. 
while we're shut down over a promise he never thought he, could, he would never keep and didn't keep. And finally, this idea that, I'm sorry to say, my colleague from Texas, and I, and I respect him, he's obviously a very intelligent person, but this idea that Democrats are for open borders is gibberish. And it is proven by what the senator from Louisiana said, which is that time after time, we have supported real border security. Not a wall that gets, that, that the Mexico pays for, that gets you attentions at campaign rallies from, from some people in America. And, and it gets talked about on, you know, Fox News at night. In 2013, Senator from Texas didn't support it, I did. In 2013, we passed a bill here in a bipartisan way. It got 68 votes. It had $46 billion in border security in it. 46! Not five billion for his rinky-dink wall he's talking about building. $46 billion of border security. It had, to be precise about it, 350 miles of what the president now refers to as steel slats. By the way, America, do you hear him not calling it a wall anymore? Now it's steel slats. Now it's a, a border barrier. 350 miles of so-called steel slats was in that bill. You know what else was in that bill? I think, Madam President, I believe you voted for that bill. I'll tell you what else was in that bill. We doubled the number of border security agents on that border. They could practically hold hands on the border. There were so many border security agents in that bill. We had billions of dollars of drone technology so that we could learn from what we've uh, learned in Afghanistan and other places <clears throat> and see every single inch of that border. Every inch! We had internal security in that bill so that small businesses and farmers and ranchers don't have to be the immigration police. So that finally in America we can actually know who came here legally on a visa but overstayed their visa because 40% of the people in this country that are undocumented are here who came legally and overstayed. We still can't do that in America because that bill passed the Senate, but it couldn't get a vote in the House because of the stupidest rule ever created called the Hastert Rule, named after somebody who's in prison. That has, that, has that has allowed a minority of tyrants in the Congress to bring a Democratic president, low, President Obama, who they didn't let do anything, <clears throat> and to ruin the speakership of John Boehner, and to allow Paul Ryan to almost accomplish nothing while he was speaker except leaving this place in a government shutdown. The so-called Freedom Caucus. And the so-called Freedom Caucus has had a veto around this place for 10 years, Madam President. Completely distorted the Republican Party here. If I do say so myself, that may sound presumptuous, but I know a lot of Republicans in Colorado who don't agree with almost anything or anything that the Freedom Caucus has stood for. Yet they have had a veto on, on, on good bipartisan legislation passed uh, by the United States Senate. So I'm not going to stand here and take it from somebody who shut the government down while my state was flooded or from a president who's saying he wants $5 billion to build some antiquated medieval wall that he said Mexico would pay for, when I helped write and voted for a bill 
that actually would have secured the border of the United States of America. That would have secured our internal defenses as well. This is a joke. And the fact that it consumes, you know, the cable networks all night, every night, and all the rest of it, this government should be open. We can debate whatever it is we want to debate. Do you think that the Chinese don't know that we can't land a spaceship on the dark side of the moon? Do you think the Russians don't know that for the first time since John Glenn was sent up <clears throat> to orbit this planet, America cannot put a person into space without asking the Russians to do it? Do you think the rest of the world doesn't know that we're not investing in our infrastructure? that we're not investing in the young generation of Americans, that we're willing to lose the race for artificial intelligence to the Chinese, that we're going to break all of our long-standing alliances since World War II at a moment when China is rising, that Chinese, China, China's GDP has quadrupled since 2001, tripled since 2003, doubled, since 2009, do, do, do we think that no one in the rest of the world knows all of that about us? We should reopen this government, Madam President, today. We should open it today. And then what I hope much more than that is that we actually come together to figure out how we're going to govern this country again and stop playing petty partisan politics that are going to do nothing to educate the next generation of Americans, that are going to do nothing to fix the fiscal condition of this country. For 10 years, for 10 years, Madam President, I've heard the junior senator from Texas, I've heard the Freedom Caucus in the House of Representatives talk about how important it is to get the fiscal condition of our government fixed. In fact, that's been the pretext for shutdowns and for fiscal cliffs and for, for all this stuff that does nothing but denigrate our democratic republic. And now, Madam President, for the first time almost in history, it happened once before in Viet during the Vietnam War, for the first time almost in history, we are actually having our deficit shooting through the roof while unemployment is falling. Never happened before. And these are the people who called Barack Obama a Bolshevik and a socialist and at the depths of the recession when when we had a 10% unemployment rate, didn't lift a finger to do anything. They have now given us a fiscal condition where our deficit is going up while our unemployment rate is falling. Do you know how hard, Madam President, it is to accomplish that? Do you know how irresponsible you would have to be to accomplish that? Yet, that's what's been accomplished. When I was first here, it was actually a little after I was first here, I used to walk through Denver International Airport, which we're very proud of in Colorado. By the way, it is the most recent airport that's been constructed in America. While we've been closed, other airports around the world, new airports have been opened just, just while we've been closed. So, so Denver International Airport is the most recent 
airport in the country to be open. It was open 25 years ago, a quarter of a century ago. And during moments like when the senator from Texas shut the government down while Colorado was underneath floods and people had lost all the things that I talked about earlier, their houses, their jobs, and their lives. I used to want to walk through that airport with a paper bag over my head because I was so embarrassed to be part of this. And I often wondered, Madam President, why anyone would, in their right mind, want to work in a place that has a 9% approval rate. In fact, I brought out a chart, two charts one day to the floor, one that showed that we hadn't always had the 9% approval rating to remind people how far we had fallen in, in the public's estimation over the time that the senator from Texas and I have been here. Uh, and then I brought another chart out that, that looked at who else has a 9% approval rating. And I, I can't remember all of it. It's sort of been lost in the mist of time. But I do remember that the uh, IRS had a 40% approval rating. Um, uh, there was an actress uh, uh, who had a 13% like, approval rating. More people wanted America to be a communist country, 11%, than approved of this country. And Fidel Castro had a 5% approval rating which was lower than our 9% approval rating. He was the only one who had a lower rating than that. And so my question often was, why would anybody want to work in a place that has such a low approval rating? And why would they want to behave in a way that only made matters worse? And I'm sorry to say this, Madam President, but there is an answer. If you think you have been sent here to dismantle the federal government, which I have lots of problems with, this federal government. I don't think it does a lot of things very well. And as a Westerner, I certainly believe we need to not be in the business of defending bad government. We need to be improving the government. But if you think your job is to dismantle it, as the Freedom Caucus does, in my view, then a 9% approval rating suits you just fine because you get to go home and say, see how terrible all those guys are? See what idiots all those guys are? While you're taking your pay, while the federal workers are not getting paid, while you're keeping your job, while they're losing their job. And there has been an effort, not just to dismantle the federal government, but to separate it from the American people. To claim that it's someone else's, or that because it's corrupt, and in many ways I think it is. I believe it is. I believe this place is one of the most corrupt parts of the whole thing. But because it's corrupt, or because it can't get its act together, or because uh, it's too far away from the people or because I think I would say because it's populated by a bunch of self-interested politicians who don't care about the priorities of the American people. But whatever the reason is, it's not separate. It is not separate. And the reason that's important is that we live in a dem democratic republic. And the founders of this country, who did two things that had never happened in human history, they led a successful armed insurrection against a colonial power in one generation. And they formed a democratic republic whose constitution was ratified by the people who had lived under it. And what they knew, because they were Enlightenment thinkers, or I should say not what they knew, what they believed, because they had only bad examples from which to draw when they sat there in Philadelphia writing that Constitution. 
But what they knew was in a republic, we would have disagreements. That was their expectation. And their belief was that out of those disagreements, we would for, and by the way, they knew we'd have disagreements because they had disagreements. And they failed on some very important things, it has to be said. They perpetuated human slavery because they couldn't come to an agreement about that. And other people who I think of as founders just as important, just as significant as those founders ended the enslavement of human beings in America and did other important things, like make sure my daughters had the right to vote. Those people also are founders. But what they believed at their core was that through our disagreements, we would forge more imaginative and more durable solutions than any king or tyrant could come up with on their own. That was their belief. That was their expectation. And I would say our country, in many ways, has eclipsed any expectation they ever had of what America would become. For the moment, we're the richest country in the world. We have the greatest capacity for self-defense of any human population in the history of the world. We are far more democratic and far more free with all of our imperfections than they would have ever imagined and probably than most of them would have ever wanted. We are the longest lived democracy in human history. But for some reason, th there is a generation of politicians in America today who don't think it's necessary to live up to the standard that they set and that the standard lots of other people have set from the founding of our country 230 years ago until today. I don't even know what day it is anymore of this, this record long shutdown. But the pretext for it is an invention. It's a creation of something in the president's mind. It was something we've learned from reading the press. There was a mnemonic uh, device used during the campaign to remind him to talk about immigration in, a, in an effort to divide Americans from one another instead of in an effort to bring us together. In an effort to turn what just three years ago was a bipartisan issue in the, the Senate, securing our southern border with $46 billion into a cudgel to be wielded at campaign rallies. And in any case, The least we could do while we have these shabby disagreements that aren't worthy of our predecessors, are not worthy of the state I represent, which is a third Democratic, a third Republican, and a third Independent, are threatening to make our generation, the first generation of Americans, to leave less opportunity, not more, to the people coming after us. A generation of politicians who are openly suggesting that America's role in the world should be diminished. The least we could do is reopen our government and stop pursuing the self-inflicted harm that it creates to have hundreds of thousands of federal workers out of work and not being paid, 
not able to support their families while we continue to stand on this floor having mindless arguments that are going to do nothing to advance the future of our country. We shouldn't shut the government down, as it has been in this case, for an, a campaign promise that the President, I'm sure, knew he could never keep. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Texas. Madam President, there's an old saying among Texas trial lawyers. If you have the facts, you bang the facts. If you have the law, you bang the law. If you don't have either one, you bang the table. We've seen a whole lot of table banging right here on this floor. The senator from Colorado spent a great deal of time yelling, spent a great deal of time attacking me personally. He did at one point briefly rise to defense of my father. I appreciate that gesture. But he spent a lot of time yelling. I will say in my time in the Senate, I don't believe I have ever bellowed or yelled at one of my colleagues on the Senate floor. And I hope that in my time before me that I don't ever do that. I think we should discuss issues and substance and facts and not simply scream and yell at each other. So let's go over some of the facts. In the senator from Colorado's angry speech, he did not dispute, number one, that he and every other Senate Democrat in 2013 voted for 350 miles of border wall. That's a fact. He has voted for 350 miles of border wall, as did every other Democrat in this chamber at that time. Number two, he did not dispute that in December of last year, the then Republican House of Representatives voted to fund the government, to fund the entirety of the government, and to secure the border. And the senator from Colorado, and I believe every other Democrat, filibustered that bill and caused the shutdown. Madam President, I voted to take up that bill. You voted to take up that bill. Had we taken up the bill, had we simply passed the bill, the House of Representatives had passed. Funding the government and securing the border, the government would never have shut down. And so it takes some degree of uh, chutzpah to stand up after filibustering funding for the government, as the Democrats did, and to blame the shutdown on the opposing party. Senator from Colorado did not dispute the Republican House voted to fund the government, and he and his Democratic colleagues filibustered that, which caused the shutdown. And number three, the senator from Colorado did not dispute that the stated reason the Democrats filibustered that bill is because it authorized the funding of 234 miles of wall. Now, I have to say, Madam President, I find it amusing. A new adjective has creeped in. It's now not 234 miles of wall. It's medieval wall. I, I don't know if there's something in there that has a moat and has catapults and they're throwing burning tar. Medieval wall now. It's kind of an odd thing. It, it, it does raise the question, well, if walls are medieval, why did the senator from Colorado and every other Democrat in 2013 vote for 350 miles of medieval wall? It, it, to the extent walls are medieval, they presumably were medieval in 2013, just as much as they are now. You know, the president has a good observation. He said, I'll tell you something else that's medieval, the wheel. There's a reason the wheel is medieval, because it rolls things and it works. Walls are effective. Unlike the senator from Colorado, I live in a border state. We have 1,200 miles of border. I have spent a great deal of time down at the border with Border Patrol agents. We have miles and miles of wall right now that are working. I've been to those walls, not once, not twice, but over and over and over again. One of the rich things about this chamber is senators from states nowhere near the border presume to lecture border states about what it's like on the border and what works securing the border. Walls are effective, and I'll tell you, every single Border Patrol agent I've asked that and I have asked dozens, probably hundreds of Border Patrol agents, are walls effective? Unquestionably, they say yes. Now, let's not, let's not construct a straw man. 
Walls aren't the only thing. You need technology. You need boots on the ground. You need all sorts of other tools. But walls, the critical point in intercepting someone crossing over illegally is the time between detection and interception. And what a wall does is slows down the traffickers to give the Border Patrol time to intercept them. And by the way, we've seen it over and over again in San Diego when they built the wall the illegal traffic plummeted. In El Paso, when they built the wall, the illegal traffic plummeted. But now the Democrats, their position, it's not substantive. They voted for 350 miles of wall, so why are they shutting the government down over 234 miles of wall? It's not substantive, it's political. Okay, we get they hate Donald Trump. If anyone in America had missed that point, that they really, really, really don't like this man, their yelling and screaming and bellowing has made that abundantly clear. But just because you hate somebody doesn't mean you should shut the government down. I voted to keep this government open right now today. The Democrats are filibustering funding for the government. Let me tell you something else the senator from Colorado didn't dispute. We had a whole colloquy with the senator from Louisiana, the senator from Mississippi, the senator from Alaska about funding the Coast Guard. Did you notice, Madam President, in that entire bellowing speech, the words Coast Guard were never uttered? Not once. What Senator Kennedy asked this body to do was pass a clean bill to pay the paychecks of the Coast Guard. Senator Kennedy's bill doesn't mention a wall, whether you like one or not, doesn't mention a medieval wall or any other kind of wall. It simply says, pay the Coast Guard, yes, no. Every Republican agrees, pay the Coast Guard right now. It's not fair to treat the Coast Guard differently than we're treating the Army and Navy and Marines and Air Force. The Senator from Colorado didn't address that because it is indisputable, it is a fact that the reason that didn't pass right now is because the Democratic leader stood up and made an objection. And by implication, every Democratic senator presumably agrees with it. The fact that the senator from Colorado didn't say, yes, we should fund the Coast Guard, and you know what? My leader was wrong when he held the paychecks of the Coast Guard men and women hostage because he wants to win a political fight with the president. And by the way, I would note to the senator of Colorado, it's not the end of the world to stand up to your party's leader. Some of us have a history of having done so in the past. We're now in the longest government shutdown in history. This shutdown needs to end. The American people want it to end. But we also need to secure the border. And Madam President, I have to say the contrast between the two parties it could not be clearer. The president has repeatedly said he wants to negotiate and he wants to compromise. He said he's willing to meet in the middle. He hasn't insisted on every mile of border wall he asked for. He hasn't insisted on every single dollar of border security. He said, let's meet and compromise. Republicans on this side of the chamber have said, let's compromise in the middle. In the position of Senate Democrats... They will not negotiate, they will not compromise, period. So their position, how many miles of wall can be built? Zero. They're not to one yet. When it comes to negotiating, their position is not an inch of wall can be built, even though we, the Democrats, already voted for 350 miles of it. Why? Because Donald Trump's president. That is an extreme and radical position. And look, I understand folks watching at home, it's hard to tell. You're, you're reading the news. It seems like both parties are bickering. It's hard to tell what's happening, particularly because on the, on the Senate floor, there's a lot of procedural mumbo-jumbo. If you want to understand what's going on, the exchange between Senator Kennedy and Senator Schumer illustrates it all. Senator Kennedy's bill did one thing and one thing only. It paid the salaries of the men and women of the Coast Guard. It didn't touch any other issue. Every Republican agrees with that bill. And the Democrats objected and said, we will not pay the Coast Guard. Had they not objected, we could put that bill on the president's desk today and they could get their paychecks right now. That is emblematic of the approach of Senate Democrats. And so, 
You know, when the senator from Colorado stopped screaming at me, he then engaged in a bit of historical retrospective about the great framers of our Constitution that I enjoyed and that I very much agree with. I am someone who spent a lifetime devoted to the Constitution. I am inspired by the framers who gave us this extraordinary democratic republic. And the senator from Colorado called for members of this body to aspire to be more like this men and women that gave us this country, gave us this republic if you can keep it, as Benjamin Franklin put it. And I concur with that, and what I would urge the senator from Colorado is to reach out to his Democratic colleagues and counsel compromise. I am urging my colleagues on this side to do the same, and the difference is the Republicans are willing to compromise, have offered to compromise, and in fact, just now sought to pay the Coast Guard, and the Democratic position is no, 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 we object. That is partisan, it is extreme, and it is not behavior. that would bring pride to the framers of our Constitution. I hope that this body can do better. I yield the floor. President, Senator from Colorado. I, th I thank the Senator for Texas for having this conversation. I, I don't think I was yelling, but I'll go watch the tape or screaming at you. I, um, I, I also have never called anybody on this floor a liar, uh, as you did somebody in 2015 on this floor. But, and I get the theatrics of all of this. Um, but I guess I want to say two things. One, I appreciate the fact that you, at least, are, seem to be uh, accepting the fact that every Democrat who is here on that immigration bill in 2013 voted for it, voted for the 350 miles of wall that you're talking about. You didn't vote for that bill, or the senator from Texas didn't vote for that bill, and I assume you had your reasons. By the way, I wouldn't presume to think what you would think about it as a border, as a person from a border state. I say it's not far from the border, and we see the effects Ill, for ill and for good of immigration in my state. But I do know this: there were two senators from a border state, the border state of Arizona, who were on that Gang of Eight bill with whom I sat day after day after day negotiating the provisions for months. And they didn't have to just vote for that bill, I mean, or against it, but they had to go home to Arizona, John McCain and Jeff Flake did, and explain why they supported it and why it was the right thing to do for Arizona, which, as the senator from Texas knows, is a border state. So the idea that there's a problem to be solved here because Democrats in this chamber are for open borders is false, as I think the senator indicated. The second point is the senator from Texas referenced Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin was standing outside the steps of Constitution Hall and somebody who was passing by this was while they were writing the Constitution, said to him, Mr. Pre Mr. Franklin, what kind of government are you creating? A monarchy or a republic? That was the question. And as, as Senator Cruz has said, his answer was a republic if you can keep it. If you can keep it. His answer was not a republic. It was a republic if you can keep it. Because he knew that the words written in the Constitution weren't going to preserve themselves. That this exercise in democratic self-government, a democratic republic, 
would require generations of women and men, not just in this chamber, but as, a, but as citizens. And I would say as founders to keep the republic that they created. And that is what is at stake here. That is what is at stake when the government has been shut down for politics, when we have a president who doesn't believe in the rule of law, who attacks judges whose decisions he disagrees with, who attacks the free press who have that freedom because of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It's that republic that's at risk when we're not educating the next generation of Americans, when we're not investing in our infrastructure. When we have the unbelievable and unprecedented fiscal hypocrisy that has resulted in a ballooning deficit while the unemployment rate is going down, it's a farce. It is a farce. And so my closing words is to say I will work with anybody, including the senator from Texas, if he would work with me, to put this sorry episode behind us. And I don't mean this sorry episode, this government shutdown, although that is a sorry and pathetic episode. But this episode of American political history where we've done so little for the next generation of Americans and done almost nothing to honor the legacy of our parents and grandparents and the people that came before them. That would be worth doing before we all die around this place. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor. Senator from Vermont. I know the Senator from Alabama is going to be following. Let's Let's put this in realistic terms. I've been here during the times of eight presidents over now beginning my 45th year. I've never seen anything like the Trump shutdown from the day it began 34 days ago to now. I hear from people every day <clears throat> about the pain and suffering this shutdown has caused. Certainly, I hear about my home state of Vermont. Tomorrow, we know that hundreds of thousands of public servants will miss their second paycheck since the shutdown began. Many of these people have had to work the entire time. They're angry. They're confused about why their paychecks are being held hostage by the president and what he appears to view as a political game. Many of these people can no longer pay their bills. They're worried about what tomorrow will bring, and all of us should worry. We know that our basic government services are no longer functioning. Our federal courts run out of money by the end of this month. Important scientific research has been put on hold. Think of what it'll cost to turn it back on. The fishing industry is in turmoil because they can't get the federal permits or inspections required to take out their boats. In the wake of a record-setting fire season, the Forest Service has curtailed thinning and fire prevention projects. Federal law enforcement and prosecutors are sounding the alarm that the shutdown is hindering important investigative work and criminal prosecutions. 
Transportation Security Administration, TSA, employees are calling in sick in record numbers after a month of being on the job with no paycheck. Some even saying they can't pay for the gas to get to their job. These are the people charged with detecting dangerous threats at our nation's airports. Instead, they're stressed and frustrated. Everybody knows that's not a very good combination. Long lines are forming at airports. The lack of TSA employees have forced some major airports to close screening areas, causing further delays. Now, I could go on and on, and, but we know the Trump shutdown is hurting our nation and our citizens. I'm going to tell you, overseas, it makes the United States of America look weak and foolish. This great country is made to look weak and foolish by the Trump shutdown. But we can end it right now, today. For the sake of the country, we should. The McConnell Amendment, the so-called end the shutdown and reopen the government act, we all know it's a non-starter. I came to the floor yesterday. I detailed why. I'm not going to repeat that here today. But it's a height of irresponsibility to use the pain and suffering of the American people as leverage to force the U.S. taxpayers to fund the president's bumper sticker, campaign slogan, Southern Border Wall, or his solemn promise that Mexico would pay for it, or to enact his hardline anti-immigrant agenda. That's what the bill does. It's not a compromise. It's not a deal. I would hope my fellow senators would oppose it. Because if we give in to these tactics now, where does it stop? What's the next thing the president will shut the government down over? Now, H.R. 268, which is what the Schumer Amendment contains, is a bipartisan bill that we should all support. It would reopen the government by extending funding for the seven remaining appropriations bills through February 8, 2019. Remember, those are appropriations bills that Chairman Shelby and I worked very hard on and passed with the committee virtually unanimously. We ought to applaud that and take them. Passage of the bill would ensure federal employees are paid and critical services are restored to provide time for negotiation and debate on border security without the American people being held hostage to the president's ill-considered anti-immigrant agenda. I urge senators to vote for it. On December 19, we passed a bill to fund the government to February 8 in this chamber. We did it unanimously by a voice vote. Republicans were in charge of both the House and the Senate at that time. In other words, the Senate was for keeping the government open. The president told the Republican leaders he would support it, and then suddenly he changed his mind, and the Republican leaders had to back off. Now, H.R. 268 also provides $14 billion in assistance to help communities and families impacted by natural disasters recover and rebuild and provide assistance to the victims of Hurricane Michael in Florence, the California wildfires, volcanic eruption in Hawaii, recent typhoons in the Pacific, other natural disasters. It also continue assistance for Puerto Rico, which is still recovering from Category 5 hurricanes Maria and Irma. But the McConnell Amendment contains a disaster package nearly identical to H.R. 268, but to appease the president, it eliminates all disaster assistance for Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a part of America. I know the president referred to it as an island surrounded by water, as though that's the only island that's surrounded by water. But our, uh, the McConnell Amendment eliminates $1.3 billion in funding for clean and safe water, drinking grants, community redevelopment funds, and nutrition assistance that would help the Americans in Puerto Rico continue their recovery. Hurricane Maria and Irma devastated Puerto Rico. It destroyed the island's homes and infrastructure. It caused the deaths of an estimated 2,975 Americans. It was one of the deadliest hurricanes this country has ever seen. Now, Congress has provided Puerto Rico with assistance in past disaster bills. 
but there are still unaddressed needs that have to be met. Absent supplemental assistance, it's estimated that 140,000 Puerto Ricans, and I reemphasize they are all U.S. citizens, are going to lose nutrition assistance at the end of March. This, in the United States of America, is it any wonder the rest of the world looks at us and says, what are you doing? We're supposed to take care of all our citizens when there's a crisis, not pick and choose based on who we are or who we're aligned with politically, just as I've voted for disaster aid in states represented by Republicans. Republicans have voted for disaster aid in my state when it's been represented by Democrats. But the president's disregard for the victims of Hurricane Maria is shameful. So I would urge Senator to vote aye on the Schumer Amendment. It would provide much-needed assistance to disaster-affected communities. It would immediately allow us to send a bill to the president to reopen the government. It's gone on long enough. The president and people in his cabinet are billionaires may not care about the harm he's inflicting on this country. But I know the members of this body, both Republicans and Democrats, do. We know what it means to govern and to lead. We have a responsibility. Do it now. Senator Shelby, whom I admire, is a friend of mine. He and I worked together last year in a bipartisan way. We got the appropriations process back on track. We showed this is a way to get things done, but then the president decided to take us off course. The Senate's an independent, co-equal branch of government. We should act like it. Let's end this national nightmare. Let's vote to open the government now for our fellow Americans. Let's do it now, today. And I yield, uh, I yield. Senator from Alabama. <clears throat> Madam President, just a few months ago, we stood here on the Senate floor uh, celebrating the progress that we had made together in the appropriations process that Senator Leahy uh, had just alluded to. We're all tired of lurching, I believe, from crisis to crisis amid partisan bickering. Both sides resolved then to put aside partisan differences and work together for the good of the American people. And it worked. Together, we funded 75% of the government on time. And while we would have preferred to have funded 100%, it was considerably more progress, Madam President, than we had made in decades here. Yet, we find ourselves here today more than a month into the longest shutdown, partial shutdown of government in American history. It's enough, I think, to give you whiplash. Funding the remaining 25% of government is the task before us here today. Homeland security, border security, that's the linchpin, we know that. Are our differences really as insurmountable as they seem? They should not be, and I want to discuss why not. Last May, the Appropriations Committee considered the fiscal year 2019 Homeland Security Bill. That bill included money for physical barrier, a physical barrier at the southern border. In fact, it included an increase in funding over the 2018 level for a physical barrier. Our Democratic colleagues made no attempt to strike this funding, just as Republicans made no effort to strike funding for Democratic priorities in the bill. And the bill passed with overwhelming bipartisan support in the committee, <clears throat> a vote of 26 to 5. There were no fireworks or histrionics in the hearing room that day. There was no demand to delay the Homeland Security Bill until the rest of the federal government was funded. Rather, Madam President, the committee simply decided together on a bipartisan basis to increase funding for a project that Congress funded the previous year. The fireworks and demands for delayed consideration came later. Madam President, 
it boggles our minds at times how we return so quickly to a standoff mode, to a zero-sum mentality after making so much progress together. It's particularly perplexing to me, considering bipartisan support is exactly what underpinned the very thing that now divides us so bitterly. Just a few months ago, funding for a physical barrier in the southern border was part of a bipartisan deal, and now we cannot even really discuss it. That was then, I understand that. But where do we go from here? Who is offering real solutions, comprehensive solutions, to end this impasse? The president, for his part, has proposed a serious, and I think a reasonable compromise, a comprehensive solution. I commend him for that. He's doing what the American people expect, I think, showing a willingness to work together to find common ground. I encourage my Democratic colleagues to reciprocate here. We have in the past. If this proposal today is unacceptable, I ask my colleagues on the other side to put something on the table that could help move us off the dime. Work with us. Propose a comprehensive solution to get us moving in the right direction. But simply saying no, demanding what we deal, that we deal with border security later, it's not going to cut it today. It will not now, so forth. So what do we do about solving our crisis? And this is a real crisis. If not now, when? When will be the time to secure the border? What good will more time, more talking do? The American people have been promised that border security will come later since the Simpson-Mazzoli amnesty in 1986. And as I look at where we are today, still waiting, still talking. The drug smuggling, the human trafficking, the chaos, it's a real crisis. We know what must be done. It's a question what will be done. I say this afternoon in the Senate, let's come together. Let's put the bitterness behind us and do what is right for the American people and end the shutdown and secure the border. Madam President, the real question before us today is this the beginning of the end or is it just the end of the beginning? We shall find out. Madam from Vermont. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Madam President. The Democratic Leader. I ask unanimous consent the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. Thank you. Now, Madam President, <clears throat> excuse me. In a moment, the Senate will proceed to two amendments, one on the President's proposal and one on a two-week continuing resolution that opens up the government with disaster assistance. Let me be clear, the two votes are not alike. The President's proposal makes radical changes to our asylum laws and demands that American taxpayers fund a border wall in exchange for reopening the government. The second vote demands nothing, no partisan demands, no ransom. It reopens the government for two weeks and provides long overdue disaster aid. And then it leaves room for us to debate how to best secure our border. Now, my Republican friends can fall in line behind the President if they choose, 
but it does not have the support of the House or the Senate. Contrary to what the Republican leader says, he says there's only one bill that will become law. Not so. His bill will not pass the Senate, will not pass the House. And so it's not the only way for us to make a law. Because after the first vote fails, Republicans will have a chance to vote with us to reopen their government. The second vote determines whether you want to reopen the government or not. The second vote determines whether you're willing to reopen the government without taking hostages, without hurting 800,000 workers, without hurting America, but open the government with no conditions. We can send that bill to the President's desk. It has already passed the House. The President may choose to veto it, just as we may choose to override that veto. My dear friend from Louisiana missed that point. If we act with 67 votes, even if the President doesn't like it, it can pass. And we all know it was the President who threw us into this turmoil when he changed his mind and opposed a bill to reopen the government without conditions, just like the one we're offering in December, and the House wouldn't go forward with it, even though the Senate voted for it unanimously. So our bill should not be controversial. Our amendment is nearly the same bill Republicans all voted for a month ago. And it shows that the one cause of this shutdown is the one person who bragged he wanted it, President Donald Trump. Last month, last month the Senate unanimously passed the short-term bill to keep the government open. It was Leader McConnell's idea. Everyone thought the President would support it. But President Trump buckled to the most extreme voices in his party and reversed his position at the 11th hour. That's how the government shutdown began, sadly and unfortunately. Since then, we've tried to negotiate with the administration to no avail. When the President's deputies made offers, the President almost immediately retracted them. The President even rejected an idea by Senator Graham, one of his staunchest allies in the Senate, to reopen government temporarily while we debate border security. Now the President is back with a straw man proposal, as the Senator from Oklahoma called it, that makes the same demand he's been making all along. $5.7 billion taxpayer dollars for a border wall he promised Mexico would pay for, and adds, one, and adds a new radical change to our asylum laws. What the President calls concessions to Democrats are the protections for DACA and TPS recipients that the President himself rescinded and has been subsequently protected by the court. Calling this a reasonable compromise is laughable. It's a starkly partisan proposal that perfectly encapsulates the President's hostage taking of the American government. Quote, this is what the President could be saying in this bill. Give me everything I want in exchange for reopening the government. A vote for the President's plan is very simply an endorsement of government by extortion. Enough is enough. Now, I know that many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle agree with me. They understand that holding our government workers hostage for a policy goal is no way to govern. I know they feel that way. So I urge them to vote yes on the second vote. Supporting our amendment doesn't mean you don't support stronger border security. To the contrary, it starts funding that effort once again. Voting for this amendment means you agree with the vast majority of the American people that the government should open without precondition. Voting for this amendment means you recognize that holding millions of Americans hostage is not a way to run our government. Voting for this amendment means that you believe members of the Coast Guard and the TSA and the DHS and the FBI should be paid for their work protecting our country. Voting for this amendment means you support our air traffic controllers and food inspectors and the men and women who work at our national parks. And yes, vote, voting for this amendment means that you support border security. It means you support a way out of the shutdown where we can sit down 
and rationally hash out our differences. If we can't do that, if we can't agree today that the way to solve disagreements over policy is through debate and consideration in Congress where it belongs, then we are staring down a very long and very dark tunnel. Our system of government was designed to allow space for disagreements, even vociferous ones. But when one side, in this case the President, uses the basic functioning our government as leverage to extract policy con con concessions, our entire system of government breaks down. It's a recipe for gridlock, dysfunction, and paralysis, not only now, but on into the future. I believe there are men and women of good faith on both sides of the aisle who want to see this senselessness come to an end today. Let the Senate come together now. Let the Senate rise to the occasion as it has done so often in the past. Vote yes on the Second Amendment. Open the people's government. I yield the floor. The clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture. Cloture motion, we the undersigned senators in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate do hereby move to bring to a close debate on Senate Amendment Number 5 to H.R. 268, an act making supplemental appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2019 and for other purposes signed by 17 senators. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on Amendment Number 5 offered by the Senator from Kentucky, Mr. McConnell, to H.R. 268, an act making supplemental appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2019, and for other purposes, shall be brought to a close? The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Baldwin. I got you. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn. Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Thank you. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes. Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde-Smith, 
Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Lankford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, yes, sir, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young, Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Burr, Cassidy, Ernst, Graham, Manchin, and Shelby. Senators voting in the negative. Baldwin, Blumenthal, Booker, Brown, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Cortez Masto, Durbin, Gillibrand, Hassan, Heinrich, Hirono, Kane, King, Leahy, Merkley, Murray, Peters, Reed, Sanders, Schatz, Schumer, Shaheen, Smith, Stabenow, Warner, Warren, Whitehouse, and Wyden. Mr. Tester, no. Mr. Rubio, aye.
Mr. Isaacson. Aye. Aye. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Ms. Duckworth. No. Mr. Moran. Aye. Ms. Harris. No. Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Udall, no.
Mrs. Feinstein. No. Ms. Cantwell. No. Mr. Braun. Aye. Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mr. Purdue, aye. Mr. Markey, no. Ms. Collins, aye. Mrs. Hyde-Smith, aye. Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Tillis, aye. Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Gardner, aye. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Inhofe, aye. Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Kramer, aye. Mr. Cotton, no. Mr. Jones, no. Mr. Young, aye. Mr. Rounds, aye.
Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye. Mr. McConnell. Aye. Ms. Cinema. No. Ms. McSally. Aye. Mr. Menendez, no. Mr. Danes, aye. Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Grassley, aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mr. Sass. Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Romney, aye.
Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Portman, aye. <laughs> Mr. Bennett. No. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Lankford, aye. Mr. Enzi, aye.
Mr. Johnson, aye. This is Blackburn. Aye. Ready to announce the vote. Is there any senator wishing to vote or change a vote? On this vote, the yeas are 51, the nays are 47. Three fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn, not having voted in the affirmative, the motion is not agreed to. The clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on Amendment Number 6 to H.R. 268, an act making supplemental appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2019, and for other purposes, signed by 17 senators. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on amendment number six offered by the Senator from New York? Mr. Schumer to H.R. 268, an act making supplemental appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2019, and for other purposes shall be brought to a close. The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal.
Mr. Blunt. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. Mr. Brown. Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell. Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Ms. Ernst. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Gardner, Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Ms. Harris, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McConnell, Ms. McSally, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Paul, Mr. Purdue, Mr. Peters, Mr. Portman, Mr. Reed, Mr. Resch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sass. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby. Ms. Cinema.
Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. <laughs> Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Bennett, Blumenthal, Booker, Cantwell, Cardin, Carper, Collins, Coons, Cortez Masto, Duckworth, Durbin, Feinstein, Gardner, Harris, Hassan, Heinrich, Perono, Isaacson, Jones, Kane, Leahy, Manchin, Markey, Menendez, Merkley, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Reed, Sanders, Schatz, Shaheen, Cinema, Stabenow, Tester, Van Hollen, Warner, Warren. Mr. Brown, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Ms. Smith, aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Schumer, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Barrasso, Blackburn, Blunt. Bozeman, Braun, Capito, Cassidy, Cornyn, Cotton, Kramer, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Ernst, Fisher, Graham, Grassley, Hawley, Hoven, Hyde Smith, Johnson, Kennedy, Lankford, Lee, McConnell, Moran, Purdue, Roberts, Rounds, Rubio, Sass, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Shelby, Sullivan, Thune, Tillis, Toomey, Wicker, Young. Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi, no. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. King, Mr. King, aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall, aye.
Mr. Portman. Mr. Portman, no. Ms. McSally, Ms. McSally, no. Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters, aye. Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inhofe, no. Mr. Romney, Mr. Romney, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. On this vote, 
The yeas are 52. The nays are 44. Three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn, not having voted in the affirmative. The motion is not agreed to. President. Senator from Texas. Mr. President, the Senate's not in order. The Senate will come to order. Mr. President, I'd ask unanimous consent that following my remarks, the Senator from Wisconsin, Senator Johnson, be recognized for five minutes. Is there an objection? Uh, could, the, could my colleague, let me reserving the right to object because we had floor time immediately after my friend from Texas. Could you give us an idea how much time you'll be using on the floor before we have the time that was, we were supposed to come immediately after you. That's my reason for raising that issue. I, I promised my, my friend from Maryland I'll be uh, less than an hour. That's no, what I'm, I, ki I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up in 10 or 15 minutes, Max. Because uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, about 15 senators that are waiting for the, the time. We were, we were originally supposed to start at 3.30, and now we're starting later. And I, I, just, I know senators are going to be inconvenient. Some have commitments. So uh, I'll remove my objection, but I just really want to, to understand that we thought we would be starting our time uh, before that. Mr. President, I understand responding to our friend from Maryland. I understand the situation. We'll try to figure out how to accommodate all senators so they get a chance to speak. Without objection. Mr. President, since the shutdown began, we've heard voices on both sides of the aisle, mine included, calling for a bipartisan solution to fund the government and end the stalemate. With Speaker Pelosi and Minority Leader Schumer refusing to even come to the negotiating table, They've made finding common ground much harder than it needs to be. This weekend, President Trump made a serious proposal that would deliver on priorities that are important to both parties, Republicans and Democrats, and bring this partial government shutdown to an end. The bill we voted on today contains key provisions on both border security. Will the senator suspend? I will. The Senate will be in order. Senators, take your conversations off the floor. Senator from Texas. The bill we voted on today contains key provisions to both bolster border security and make improvements to our immigration system as a whole. As we've heard from the Border Patrol experts time and time again, we need sensible solutions, which along the border consists of three components. It's physical barriers in some locations, it's technology in others, and personnel in others, or some combination of those three. President Trump himself has said he understands there doesn't need to be a wall from sea to shining sea, and he's acknowledged that the role of technology and personnel in border security. But we need to prevent the illegal movement of goods and people without inhibiting legitimate trade and travel. I'd like to show colleagues just uh, one example of a physical barrier in Texas that uh, was voted on in a bond election in Hidalgo County, Texas. These are folks who live right on the border. They voted to pay for this levee wall. The reason? Because they knew that the levees, levee system had to be improved in order to get insurance companies to write insurance so they could build and develop the property in Hidalgo County, Texas. They also talked to the Border Patrol about what the Border Patrol needed to control the movement of illegal immigration across the border, and they came up with a win-win proposition, a levee wall, which was appropriate, is appropriate at this particular location. But this was voted on as a bond election by the voters in Hidalgo County, Texas, and did not involve spending any federal money. My simple point is there are solutions that can be worked out if we consult the experts, the Border Patrol, to find out what exactly they need for border security that will meet with public approval along the border and represent a win-win. Recently, when the president was in, was in uh, McAllen, Texas, 
Senator Cruz, my colleague from Texas, and I had a meeting with mayors and county judges after the president's entourage left to come back to Washington, D.C. I remember specifically my friend, Judge Eddie Trevino, the county judge of Cameron County, Texas, that's where Brownsville, Texas is, who said, if it's the Border Patrol and Customs and Border Protection telling us what we need in order to secure the border, we're all in, he said. But if it's people up in Washington, D.C. making political judgments, politicians trying to micromanage how the border can be secured, we remain deeply skeptical. I think that ought to be, uh, those wise words ought to guide us in our discussions going forward. But not only did the legislation that embodied the President's proposal invest in critical components along the border, it included more than a billion dollars for improvements and personnel at our ports of entry. You talk to anybody who knows anything about the movement of illegal drugs, heroin, methamphetamine, fentanyl across the border, most of it comes through the ports of entry, embedded in trucks and trailers and personal vehicles. And we need more technology in order to scan those vehicles in secondary uh, review. And we need to, be, in order to detect them and deter them, to interdict them, but we need the personnel to be able to do that without impeding legitimate trade and travel. So these are priorities which I've long advocated for based on feedback from the experts, the law enforcement officers, community leaders, and folks who live and work along the Texas-Mexico border every day. But as we all know, the challenges that exist within our immigration system don't end at our borders. With a court backlog of roughly 800,000 cases deep nearly a million people living in the U.S. with temporary legal status, and the loopholes that make enforcing some of our immigration laws nearly impossible. So there is much more that needs to be done. That's why this legislation includes provisions to build the foundation of real immigration reform, something heralded by both parties. This bill generously granted provisional status to current DACA, and te temporary protected status recipients who live each day not knowing if or when they be forced to live, leave the United States. It does not offer a path to citizenship or a long-term solution. I wish we could do that, but we don't have a long-term solution. But it does provide stability for three years while Congress works on a legislative fix. So this is far from a solution to the pervasive problems in our immigration system, but it is a start. And a journey of a 1,000 miles begins with a single step. And this represents a first step. Most, most importantly, though, this legislation funds the departments and agencies that have been shuttered since December the 22nd. This shutdown may have begun as a battle over border security, but it's affecting men and women in all 50 states whose jobs have nothing to do with border security. As well, people at the Department of Agriculture the Justice Department, the Interior Department, Housing and Urban Development, Treasury, there's NASA, the National S Space Agency, and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Food and Drug Administration, the Peace Corps, all of the people working for each of these government agencies are working without pay or have been furloughed. Not only is the partial shutdown impacting the critical work being done by these departments and agencies, it's harming the dedicated men and women who work there, those tasked with executing and enforcing laws written by this very body. Mr. President, the uh, Senate's not in order. Senate will be in order. Mr. President, since the shutdown began 34 days ago, more than 800,000 federal workers have lost the security of knowing when their next paycheck will come. To tomorrow is the second paycheck they'll miss, meaning they have now gone more than a month without income. Yesterday when I was in, in uh, Austin and then in Dallas, I was told that people who routinely volunteer their time at the food bank in those locations now find themselves going to the food bank and seeking food so they can feed their families because they're missing a government paycheck and can't provide for them without the generosity of those food banks. I also went to events in Austin and Dallas, met with the U.S. attorneys in both of those locations talking about our efforts to counter human trafficking 
and child exploitation. What I learned is that the prosecutors, the frontline prosecutors who prosecute these kinds of cases aren't being paid. But maybe more, trouble, more troublesome is the fact that not or either are the FBI agents that conduct the investigations or the administrative personnel that support the U.S. Attorney's offices. So this is harming our ability to prosecute, to investigate and prosecute human trafficking and child exploitation cases too. People are being forced to work without pay and it's harming not only them, but the victims of these horrific crimes. Mr. President, the Senate's not in order. Mr. President, more than 110,000 of these unpaid federal workers earn less than $50,000 a year, and they rely on their paycheck to make ends meet. They are not millionaires. While we did pass legislation to guarantee that these public servants will eventually get their pay, that does nothing to help them in the interim. Federal workers are forced to make decisions that no family should have to consider. For a single mom who's a federal correctional officer in Arizona, that means turning off her heat, never letting the temperature get higher than 60 or 65 degrees in order to cut costs. For a mom in Wisconsin who works in the Department of Interior, that means rationing her insulin because she can't afford the $300 copay. This shutdown is deeply impacting thousands of federal workers and their families all across the country, including Texas. For one Texan who works at the Internal Revenue Service, he says he's been sleeping in, so he only has to worry about eating two meals a day, not three. One woman whose husband is in the Coast Guard drove from Galveston to Ellington Field, that's in Houston, about 40 miles each way to pick up free diapers for their kids. On a recent trip home, I heard specific examples about the impact the shutdown has had on the Department of Justice, which I mentioned just a moment ago, and the heartbreaking challenges they are facing every day. These dedicated men and women have chosen their careers in public service. They want to go to work. They want to be able to pay their bills. And it's time for us to do our job so they can do theirs with the dignity and the pay that they earn. I'd like to remind all our colleagues that our constituents did not send us to Washington so we could simply vote no on a less than perfect piece of legislation. If that were the case, we'd never get anything done here. We were elected to work with our colleagues to create legislation so we can get to yes, to build consensus and to solve problems, not to score political points. Are there certain pieces of legislation that I don't agree with? Well, of course, but parts of this legislation that we just voted on, but it does fund priorities critical to our southern border and to the people of Texas. And right now, this is the only bill that I've seen that includes priorities of both parties that, could, that uh, carries the president's support. I voted for this legislation to support the men and women who have been treated as collateral damage throughout this unnecessary government shutdown. Those who are forced, forced to apply for food stamps or unemployment who would rather be working who can't pay their medical bills or child care, who not only want this shutdown to end, they need for this shutdown to end. We aren't here to hold show votes on legislation that the president won't sign. Just ask the elementary school civics students and they can tell you that's not how a bill becomes a law. This was a serious offer by the president to end this shutdown and build the trust and goodwill necessary to have real reform. And I'm disappointed that our colleagues voted against this bill. That was a vote not on the merits of the president's proposal. That was a vote to get on the bill so it could be amended. In other words, our colleagues who voted against the bill aren't even interested in having a conversation about how we solve this problem and how we find our way out of this box canyon. And unfortunately, there are those who for political reasons, continue to lack any interest in negotiating a compromise bill that can earn bipartisan support. We solve difficult problems every day in the United States Congress on a bipartisan basis, every single day. But somehow, we've decided we can't solve this problem, and I only 
fear that it's not because of the difficulty of the problem presented, it's because of the politics that have paralyzed us and made it impossible for us to bridge our differences. I thank the President for this comprehensive offer and the Majority Leader for bringing it to the floor so we can vote on it, so we could vote on it. And I would urge all of our colleagues now that we've had these two failed votes, we know we're right where we started when we got here today, that we work together to try to bridge our differences, to build consensus, and end this shutdown. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Wisconsin. I, is the uh, minority leader on the floor? Chair does not see him. Um, yesterday, Chaplain Black opened the Senate by quoting the gospel according to Luke. He said, those who work deserve their pay. I could not agree more. First of all, I want to thank the finest among us, members in the Coast Guard, TSA, Customs Border Protection, ICE, all the men and women who, because of federal law, we require to work, who are caught up in this, this shutdown politics, which I don't agree with, and they're not getting paid. It's a basic principle that we should pay these individuals. Earlier today, uh, my colleague, Senator from Alaska, with other Republican colleagues, came on the floor asking a pretty simple question, proposing a bill to pay the men and women of the Coast Guard. And for some reason, the minority leader, the Democrats, objected to this very fair proposal. Today, I'm coming to the floor to offer as an amendment a bill that I introduced 10 days ago. This has been talked about in the press. We have, I think, 24 Republican co-sponsors of the Shutdown Fairness Act, which does a pretty simple thing. It simply pays those individuals that are doing the work trying to keep this nation safe. So let me just say that I ask unanimous consent, now that I see the minority leader here, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar number one, House Joint Resolution one. I ask unanimous consent that the Johnson Amendment at the desk be agreed to, the bill is amended, be considered, read a third time and passed, and that the motion to reconsider be considered and made and laid upon the table. Is there an objection? Now, I heard my good friend from Wisconsin say he didn't give one good reason to object to the Coast Guard. No, there's not one. There are 740,000, the or 760,000, if that's the right number. The number of non-Coast Guard workers who are not getting paid. Similarly here, it will be easy for any member to get up and pick and choose and say, pay these, pay those, don't pay these, don't pay those. Our position on this side is simple. They should not be held hostage. They should not be said, we're not going to pay you unless we get our way on the wall, which is exactly what President Trump is doing and exactly what my colleagues, with some exceptions, have decided to do on that side of the aisle, including my good friend from Wisconsin. That is not fair. Everyone deserves to be paid. These are all hardworking people. They've all done nothing wrong. They all get up Monday morning, even if they have a fever or something, to go to work because they believe in what they're doing. They're government workers. And to pick and choose some and not others is the wrong way to go and would lead to a cacophony. Every one of us could get up and say, Maybe we should say, just pay the workers in Brooklyn, New York. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. And so I would modify my friend's objection. I'd, I'd expand it to all of our federal workers, which is only fair. So reserving the right to object, would the senator modify his request to ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of H.J. Res 28, which has been received from the House, making further additional continuing appropriations through February 28th, that the joint resolution be considered, read a third time and passed, and the motion to reconsider be made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Does the senator from Wisconsin so modify his request? I, I do object because we basically just voted on that. The Senate, in its wisdom, voted that down. The president would not sign that. That would not become law. And it's, this, it's the, the minority leader who's holding 
400 some thousand individuals who are actually working that should get pay. He is the one holding them hostage. But I'd like to yield to the senator from Tennessee. No, nope, I comments. object to that. I am in the middle of an objection. Okay, then he can speak. I, in fact, the objection to the modification is heard. Leader McConnell has requested I go to his office. I think that's more important than some of these activities. And I am going the to senator. I am going to object. The Democratic leader does not have the floor. Does the Democratic leader object to the original request? Objection is heard. The senator from Wisconsin. Now, Mr. President, I'd like to turn it over to the senator from Tennessee for a few comments. Is there a question? <laughs> Without objection. When 60 seconds is up, so the Senator from Alaska can have 60 seconds, and then we can go on to the colloquy that people have been waiting for. Is there objection? Is there objection? Without, Without you, objection. Mr. President, this is what we just heard. The Senator from Wisconsin said he asked consent that the Senate approve paying the 400,000 workers who are being forced to work without pay. No Republican objects to the senator from, uh, from Wisconsin's idea, but the Democratic leader does. That means the Democratic leader is saying to 53,000 TSA employees who make about $40,000 a year that he objects on behalf of the Democratic side to paying them while they're forced to work. He is saying to 54,000 Customs and Border Protection agents that he objects to paying them while they are forced to work. Senator Johnson says that on the Republican side, we want to pay 42,000 Coast Guard employees who are forced to work and aren't paid. The Democratic leader says he objects to that. And to 14,000 air traffic controllers, 16,000 Bureau of Prisons Corrections officers, 35,000 IRS employees, they are being forced to work. Republicans are saying, pay them. The Democratic leader objects. Mr. President. Mr. President. The senator from Delaware, or from Maryland. Close by. Uh, Mr. President, I had um, previously notified the floor about a, a group of senators that want to join together to send a clear message that we are committed to working together to end the shutdown and, and responsibly dealing with border security in, in, in a true bipartisan manner. This is a group of equal number of Democrats and Republicans, Senator Murkowski, is leading this on the Republican side on the floor today. And I would ask consent that for the next hour, the two of us have, uh, uh, that we control 30 minutes of time that I control and 30 minutes of time that Senator Murkowski would control. Is there objection? Without objection. Mr. President, uh, during this floor time, I think you're gonna see clear messages coming from Democratic senators, and Republican senators that this shutdown needs to end, that we need to pass a short-term, three-week clean CR so that we can have time to consider the President's request and work together on a bipartisan border security package. I want my colleagues to know that we have been meeting uh, regularly in an effort to try to see where we can find common ground. And we feel pretty confident that we can find common ground if we can get government open and get to work in a responsible manner to deal with border security in the best interests of the people of this nation. Mr. President, I want to first yield to my friend from Virginia, Senator Warner, uh, and then I will uh, yield time. I will give up the floor to Senator Murkowski. Mr. President. The Senator from Virginia. Mr. President, I appreciate my friend, the Senator from Maryland, yielding time. And I appreciate the fact that this may be the first time at least in the last few weeks, where a group of senators from both sides of the aisle are actually coming together to find agreement. Not to score gotcha points, but to find agreement. I promise the senator I'd be very brief. It is clear this government shutdown needs to come to an end. My hope would be as we move towards that conclusion, we will also look at the issues 
revolving around particularly low-paid federal contractors who will get no relief when the government reopens. I also hope that we could work together. I've got legislation called the Stop Stupidity Act, um, good name, uh, that may need further amendment that would try to prohibit future shutdowns being used by either party on a going forward basis. What I think we need to do, and I think other colleagues will acknowledge this, is let's take a three-week short-term CR. Let's consider the President's proposal. And let me be clear, if the President is watching, this Senator would commit to good faith negotiations. This Senator will commit to supporting increased border security beyond what we just voted on, on the so-called Democratic proposal. That kind of increase, commitment for increased border security, I hope the President would take as a good faith effort and would be responded so we could get this government reopened on the short-term basis and the kind of horror stories we all can recount about our workers, contractors, and oftentimes private businesses that surround those federal entities, federal installations, who will see no relief, can actually get their operations back opening. Um, I had a much more ar articulate additional three, mom three minutes worth, which I will submit for the record. Thank my senator, uh, thank my friend, the senator from, um, from Maryland for granting me this time. Thank the senator from Alaska for leadership on her time. But let's see if this eight can go forth and multiply so that before this weekend is over, we can get our, our workforce back, back to work doing the people's business. With that, Mr. President, I yield back to the Senator from Maryland. Mr. President. Senator from Alaska. Mr. President, I appreciate colleagues being down here again on a bipartisan basis to talk about where we are at this moment. We've just had two messaging votes. Both of those votes failed. I voted for both of them because my message was, I want to get this government open. I want to do it quickly and with the sense of urgency that responds to the men and women who have been so significantly impacted by this partial government shutdown for the past 34 days. I also want to be fair to the President's priorities that he's articulated in, in, the, leg in the proposal that he has, has provided to us as recently as Saturday. I think we can do this together. So my message to folks back home, my message to people is don't give up hope because now is the time that we all must come together to address these issues. But you can't do it when the government is shut down. So I have indicated that I am supportive of a measure that Senator from Maryland, Senator Cardin, has introduced that will allow for a short-term CR, three weeks, allow us then to go through, whether it's the appropriations process, the Judiciary Committee process, but allow us to have this debate on these important priorities. Allow us to do the business of the United States Senate, to do the business of legislating, but let's also allow the business of the government to proceed by opening up the government right now. So we'll have an opportunity to go back and forth uh, amongst colleagues. I'll remind folks that we have very limited periods of time, so I'm going to yield to my colleagues on the other side. But it's so important that we're coming together now to offer some glimmer of hope. Uh, th thank you. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree more, Madam, Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. I, I couldn't agree more with my friend from Alaska, the way that she worded it. Uh, we're going to work together to get government open as quickly as possible. And with that, I would yield to my friend from Delaware, Senator Coons. Senator from Delaware. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'd like to thank my colleagues from Alaska, from Maryland, and from other states for their willingness to spend so much time talking, listening, and trying together to craft a path forward. The role the Senate has historically played in our constitutional order uh, is one where we are the body that others look to when there is either an inflexibility or an unreliability in negotiating a path forward. We've got lots of folks across this country suffering from this government shutdown. It's having an impact that all of us could detail. But I have to ask, what's it going to take for us to reopen this government? Is it going to take a, a breakdown in food security or airline security? Is it going to take 
an increase in crime or terrorism, an accident or thousands more Americans struggling to feed their families, losing housing or electricity. I won't go on with the list, but we all know the human cost of this shutdown. I'm here to join my friends, my colleagues from both parties in saying that we are intent on making a good faith effort to reopen the government for three weeks, to promptly support good faith negotiations, to address the president's priorities, to discuss what effective modern investments in border security and changes in immigration policy would look like, and then reach a resolution in three weeks or less. We have to be able to do this. We have to show our country and the world that democracy can work, and I am optimistic that with the passion and the commitment I've heard from my bipartisan colleagues who stand on the floor with me tonight, that it is possible to get this done, and that whatever gets taken up and considered in regular order by this body could then be passed by the House and signed into law by the President. Let us take a first bold step together today and sign on to an amendment that my colleague from Maryland has committing us to a clean three-week continuing resolution, reopening the government, and promptly negotiating in good faith to increase investment in border security. Mr. President, thank you. And with that, I yield the floor. That the Senator from Maine be recognized at this time. The Senator from Mr. Maine. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, this shutdown, the longest in our history, must come to an end. It has already caused far too much harm to 800,000 dedicated federal employees and their families who are struggling to pay bills without paychecks and are on the verge of missing yet another paycheck. It has hurt the American people who need to interact with federal agencies, including seniors, low-income families, people with disabilities who worry about their housing assistance. It's damaging our economy, causing a drop in consumer confidence and consumer spending. Ironically, shutdowns always end up costing the government more money than if we had operated as we should. Mr. President, I see a glimmer of hope here. We at least have had two votes today on two different plans. And like the senator from Alaska and others, I supported both plans because my priority is to reopen government. But where I am really optimistic is the fact that 16 senators are on the floor, equally divided between the two parties, and willing to compromise. Compromise is not a dirty word. It is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength. Let us compromise to reopen government, address border security, and get on with the business of this country. Thank you, Mr. President. President. Senator from Maryland. At this time, I would yield to my colleague from Arizona, Senator Sinema. The Senator from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to start by thanking uh, my colleague from Maryland and from Alaska for bringing us together today, but also for the work that our group has been putting in for the last several weeks to find a solution to end this harmful and hurtful shutdown. The voters of Arizona want a government that is lean, that allows them to pursue their individual interests, and that above all, does not detract from their everyday life. And unfortunately, when the federal government is shut down as it is today, it detracts and takes away from the quality of life for folks in Arizona. Recently, the President asked the United States Congress to consider appropriations for border security. And I stand in support of working together across the aisle with my colleagues here in the Senate to answer that request. Arizona needs enhanced funding for border security. And I feel confident that if given three weeks, the Republicans and Democrats together in this body could find a reasonable compromise 
that both continues to keep our government operating in a lean and efficient way while also providing for efficient and effective border security. In Arizona, we bear the brunt of a government that has failed its duty to secure our border and protect our communities. In Arizona, we bear the brunt of our country's failure to solve the immigration crises that we live in today. In Arizona, we have been waiting for over three decades for the United States Congress to solve this problem so that we in Arizona can live our lives free from unnecessary government interference and with the full freedom that our country has promised us. I believe that if we work together over the next three weeks, that we can find a compromise, we can find a solution to this challenge, and we can with, work with our colleagues in the House and send a piece of legislation to the President that will meet the security needs of our country and ensure that we keep government operating efficiently and effectively for the people of my state and for this country. I look forward to working over the next several weeks to solve this challenge. And I request that the President allow us those three weeks to find this bipartisan solution together. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield back. Mr. President, I would ask that the Senator from South Carolina be recognized. The Senator from South Carolina. Thank you. I uh, just got off the phone with the President. I told him we're talking about a three-week CR, and all of us believe if we had three weeks with the government open, with all the discord coming from a shutdown, that we could find a way forward to produce a bill that he would sign that would be good for everybody in the country, but we need that opportunity. He gave me some indications of things he would want for a three-week CR that would be good faith, down payment, a moving forward that I thought were eminently reasonable. Rather than me telling you about what he said, I think Senator Schumer uh, and Senator uh, uh, McConnell will be talking about this. So the three-week CR concept is a good idea, and what the President wants to add to it made sense to me, and it gets gets us back in the ball game. Here's what's going to happen. The TPS language that was sent over by the president is a move forward, but it's unacceptable to my Democratic colleagues. It needs to be like what Tim Kaine did. The DACA provision sent over by the president is moving forward, but it needs to be what Senator Durbin did. Because they're both, I think, reasonable proposals that the president should be able to accept. To my Democratic friends, Money for a barrier is required to get this deal done. It will not be a concrete wall, and the money will be a program to a DHS plan that all of you know about and have been briefed on and should approve. You're not giving President Trump a bunch of money to do anything he wants to with. He's got to spend it on a plan that the professionals have come up with. You want $800 million for refugee assistance, you'll get it. We all need more judges. 250 more Border Patrol agents on the border would be good for us all. I want to let the public know I've never been more optimistic than I am now if we can find a way to open up the government for three weeks. If we fail, everybody can say we did our best, one last chance to get this right. And I'm just hoping and praying that what the President's asking for, Senator Cardin, in addition to your three-week CR, you'll entertain, and let's get to work. If we could get in a room We'll fix this, and it won't take three weeks. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. I, I'm now pleased to yield to my colleague from Maryland, Senator Van Hollen, who's been a real partner uh, during his stay here in the United States Senate. We've traveled the state of Maryland together, and we know firsthand the hardships of this shutdown. We've seen the faces, and we've seen the consequences. Uh, yield to my colleague, Senator Van Hollen. The other senator from Maryland. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank my uh, friend and partner, from Maryland for all his work in ending the shutdown. And I want to thank um, him as well as our friend, uh, the senator from Alaska, Senator Murkowski, for bringing us together in a bipartisan way to try to find a solution to end this shutdown as soon as possible. And that's why I support the bipartisan amendment that will be filed this afternoon uh, to open the government for three weeks, for three weeks. I should stress, Mr. President, this is not my preferred solution. I would like to take up 
uh, the bill that's at the desk that would open eight of the nine federal departments right away and give us time to deal with the Department of Homeland Security. But the proposal before us is our best option at this point in time for resolving this shutdown. What will three weeks accomplish? That's a fair question. Well, first of all, it will allow federal government employees, all of them, to get back to work for the American people, to help resume vital services. Number two, it will make sure that all of them get paid, both those who are working without pay and those who have been locked out. And that's important because all of us know that tomorrow marks the second full pay period when they will get a big fat zero on their paychecks even as their bills keep coming in the door. It'll also do something else that's very important. It will give the Senate and the House a little breathing room, a little breathing room to work together on a bipartisan basis to address a number of priorities. Priorities to make sure that we provide adequate border security, and that can include additional resources. Spend some time to address some immigration uh, issues, including those that were just mentioned uh, by the senator from South Carolina. But this time and space, Mr. President, is absolutely needed, I believe, to allow us to work together in a bipartisan way. And while three weeks may not sound like a lot of time, uh, in part that will help focus our attention on getting the job done. And we will all be held accountable in the House, in the Senate, in the White House for getting our work done in that period. So I want to I wanna thank our colleagues for showing this good faith in trying to find a solution to doing it. Take three weeks, open the government, and let's have those very important discussions. Let's do it in a sober and serious way. And if we do so, I'm confident that we can find a a permanent uh, result that will help us uh, get out of this crisis. And I uh, thank the Senator and um, yield back my time. Mr. President. Senator from Alaska. I request that we yield to the Senator from Georgia. I thank the Senator from Alaska. The Senator from Georgia. <clears throat> All Democrats and Republicans pay close attention. I've been here 20 years. I've seen a lot of shutdowns, about five of them. I want to talk about what they produced. The first one under Bill Clinton produced Monica Lewinsky. That's how they got in all the trouble because she was an intern in the White House and idle hands are never good. For us, Newt Gingrich lost his job in the same shutdown. He lost his job because he lost six votes in the House, couldn't get reelected speaker. I had to replace him and I'm kind of glad that happened, but that's still not a good result and not a good reason to have a shutdown. A few years later, great senators, John McCain being one of them, Ted Kennedy being another, worked their fingers to the bone, and came up with a great immigration bill, which I was a part of in my first term in the Senate. And we got castigated and ruined because all of a sudden amnesty became a four-letter word. And political consultants found, found it an easy way to run against people in the party. And so for 20 years, 15 years, we've been beating each other over something that ought to be easy to do. And that's changed for the better. You know, a lot of people think Congress's job is to come to Washington and change things for the better. When it comes to immigration, all we ever change is the subject. We never end the debate, we never pass a result, and oftentimes we call each other names for the wrong reason. I'm here for one reason, to thank the colleagues that are on the floor here and all those others who are ready to do some business. I'm ready to do some business. It's time we put the good workers in our government back to work. It's time we were doing what we promised the people in the United States of America to do, and it's time we went to work. Because when everybody's out of work, it's our fault. They're, do they're the people that carry the mail, empty the garbage, cook in the cafeteria, clean up the parks, do everything they do without complaint whatsoever. But they're out there, many of them not even being paid right now while we're sitting here debating a subject that we can't reach a solution on, period. We need to take our armor off, leave our weapons at the door, walk in the room, shake hands, grab Ben Cardin's hand and say, Ben, thank you for making an effort as a Democrat. Lisa, thank you as a Republican for supporting it. And let's sit down and let's pass a bill that we can both agree on that gets Americans back to work and restores the spirit of Ellis Island and the pride of the United States of America. And I yield back. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. I've joined Senator Isaacson on many bills in this, uh, since I've been in the Senate. So I look forward to working with him to find the solution in regards to the border security issues. And I, I thank him for his comments. 
I'll yield now to my colleague from Maine, Senator King, who's been uh, so instrumental in trying to come up with concrete ways to end the shutdown. Mr. President. The Senator from Maine. Mr. President, it strikes me that there are really two problems before us. One, we can resolve in this evening, tomorrow morning, in the next 24 hours. That is the shutdown. Or at least we can resolve it for a limited period of time, and then we can start talking about the second problem, which is border security. I think one of the unfortunate uh, real realities of what's happened in the last month is, a, is an assumption on the part of some that there was not good faith on border security and no interest in doing border security from this side of the aisle. That is a misunderstanding. I voted in 2013 for the largest border security provision that I think has ever come before the United States Senate. So did virtually every member of this caucus and uh, a third or more of the other caucus. Two-thirds of the Senate voted for that bill with a very important border security provision. I want to be very clear. I am very supportive of border security and increasing border security. There also may be cases where there are parts of the border where some kind of barrier makes sense and is cost effective, whereas there are other areas of the border where it doesn't. What I'm interested in is a thorough discussion with the experts about what is the most cost effective way to protect our citizens and secure the border, and I believe this proposal today gives us the breathing space to have that discussion. I would remind my colleagues that the administration, this administration, submitted a border security proposal to the Congress last February with their budget of $1.6 billion, and lo and behold, that was approved by the Appropriations Committee and by this body. So that's an indication to me that there is good faith. And I think the important thing to communicate now is let's not complicate this with conditions. Let's take the hammer, the awful hammer, and I don't have to reiterate all that's been said today about the devastating effect of this shutdown on people in all of our states and on people who are working for no pay, which is fundamentally wrong. We should take that away and then spend the next three weeks finding a solution, which I believe we can do. I've had enough discussions with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. I think there's a solution to be had that will satisfy the president, the two bodies of Congress, but most importantly, the American people in terms of the protection that we can provide. So I'm happy to join my colleague today uh, in, in supporting this message and importantly, my colleagues across the aisle because give us a breathing space, take the problem of the shutdown away, and then we can have a, a discussion and debate and find a solution through a process that is the way it ought to be, not with a shutdown being something that's hanging over everyone. That's not the way we should be governing, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on finding a creative, cost-effective, and safe solution to this issue of border security to protect this country. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield the floor. Mr. President, how much time remaining on the Republican side? 21 minutes. Thank you. I now turn to the senator from Ohio. I thank my colleague from Alaska. Thanks for her leadership today. And uh, my colleague from Maine who just spoke and from Maryland and, and all of my colleagues who are out here on the floor. By the way, there are several Republicans who came up to me over the last hour and said, can I speak in this colloquy? And we didn't have time for all of them, but that's a good sign. It shows that there are a lot of members, 16 here on the floor and many others, who believe that it's time for us to figure this out. No one likes a government shutdown. I've put out a bill five times now to the Congress saying let's end government shutdowns. It, it by the way, is getting a few more co-sponsors now, and it should, because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for the families who are affected, including those who are going to work without pay, living paycheck to paycheck, true hardship. It doesn't make sense for the taxpayers, who never end up winning in these government shutdowns. We end up paying after the fact, but often for government services that were never provided, because that's how shutdowns work. And finally, it's bad for the economy. If we go another few weeks, there'll be one point off our GDP, which is a huge deal to wages and jobs, economic growth. So let's get this thing behind us. Now, there is a serious issue here, which is how do we secure the border? And our southern border is a mess. I call it a crisis. Others call it something else. But we have to address this. The president's right about that. I'm hopeful today, and I'm hopeful for three reasons. One, we just went through a process where, yeah, there was failure on both sides. We had two proposals out there, as expected. Nobody expected they would pass. It was 
an opportunity, I guess, for voices to be heard, but no one expected it to pass. But now, after this, the pieces are being put back together by this group and others. And I just listened to my colleagues on the other side. And I just listened to what Senator King said. They want border security. <laughs> they want to enhance what's going on in the border now. Senator King just talked about the need for more barriers. I mean, look, if you're serious about this, you have to acknowledge that what we know is there are more people crossing. In the last two months, which we have records for, there were twice as many as a year ago. There's about a 50% increase in families crossing, about a 25% increase in kids crossing. There's been a 3,000% increase in the last five years in asylums, being, you know, people coming forward and claiming asylum. I mean, this is a problem we've got to address. It's, it's a huge problem with regard to drugs. Now, I come from Ohio. We're getting hit hard by heroin and crystal meth that's coming across the border from Mexico. We're not stopping enough of it. We're stopping very little of it, which is why Democrats and Republicans alike have said more screening at ports of entry. I agree. So I appreciate what my colleagues have said on the other side of the aisle, and I'll let them speak for themselves going forward, but they want border security too. And the fact they were talking about it today in terms of coming up with a solution here to enhance security, I'm encouraged by. Second, I like the fact that the president put out a proposal. I think he should have put out a proposal that was a compromise, and he did, because he said, okay, we're not just going to have more border security, we're going to deal with about a million people who are in temporary protected status coming from these 10 countries. We don't want to send them back because there's a war or there's strife or there's a natural disaster. It's about 400,000 people. And we're going to take care of the people who have come here as children through no fault of their own and now find themselves in this uncertain status. Uh, these are the so-called DACA recipients. It's time for Congress to act on this, I think. But again, the president put forward a plan that said, OK, you guys help me on border security. I'm also going to deal with these other issues that many Democrats have talked about for years. So that makes me hopeful that finally we're talking about these issues. And I agree with what Lindsey Graham said. We can do more on these two. And we can do more on some other issues that Democrats care about. And I believe the administration is willing to do that. But gosh, at least we're finally talking. Finally, I'm encouraged by the fact that we're not that far apart. And let me be specific. I think that both the administration and Democrats have mischaracterized the president's plan as it relates to barriers on the southern border. It may surprise you to learn that in the president's proposal he's just given us, it's not 2,000 miles of the border. He's talking about his interest in 234 more miles. No wall in the sense of a cement wall, concrete wall. He has said it'll be fences, it'll be vehicle barriers, low barriers, it'll be pedestrian wire fences, but it won't be done by what the White House says is the right thing to do, it'll be done by experts. And the experts are in the Border Security Improvement Plan, which we embraced in this Congress in the last appropriation bill for FY18 that we're working on now, that's what the CR is, and in the new one that was just passed last summer. We said this plan is the right plan because it says what kind of barriers are going to be where. People said, how did the president come up with $5.7 billion? You know how he came up with it? because he wanted to fund the top 10 priorities, priorities of the border security improvement plan put out by the experts. That's what that is. Now, we can disagree on whether that's too much money, too little money, whatever, but it is only 234 miles out of 2,000 miles. It's almost all in Texas, places where there's not fencing as opposed to California and Arizona where there's a lot of fencing, or, or New Mexico even. And we can say, well, maybe that's, that's too much. Maybe we go more slowly, but this is a plan that we had all, as Republicans and Democrats, with a huge vote out of the Appropriations Committee, said this is the plan we ought to follow. So I don't think we're that far apart. I think both sides, frankly, need to start characterizing the plan accurately and stop talking past each other. And I think if we do that with reasonable members on both sides of the aisle here, we can come up with something that makes sense. Yes, to help secure our southern border, which everybody wants to do, and do it in a smart way, not waste money. Walls are not the only answer. Fences are not the only answer. You've got to have more sensors, more cameras. You've got to have more immigration judges, which Democrats want. So does the president in his proposal. You've got to have more screening for these drugs coming in. You've got to help in terms of the human trafficking. These are things that both parties want to do. So I'm optimistic, though frustrated, <laughs> really frustrated by their shutdown, but more optimistic today because I hear on the other side of the aisle a willingness to come forward. I sense with the president's new proposal there's a willingness to reach out. And folks, it's time. Let's stop this shutdown. Shutdowns are stupid. 
Let's protect that southern border, and let's move forward on other priorities we have in this Congress. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. Uh, I certainly appreciate the, the words from Senator Portman. The two of us have been working together from when we were in the House of Representatives, and we're proud that we have a record of concrete accomplishments working together across party line. Sometimes we had to take on the leadership in both of our parties, but we got things done. So I'm encouraged by your comments, and I really do believe we can work together to resolve this issue. And with that, I'd like to yield to, to my colleague from West Virginia, Senator Manchin, who's been a, a, a real leader on the, the practical impact that this <laughs> shutdown has. A story about what's happening in the prison that's located in West Virginia really frightened, I think, all of us. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Cardin. Thank you, Senator Murkowski, Senator Collins, all, all my colleagues here. This is a good step. We're all here the first time after 30 days. But guess what? If you've been back home talking to the people that are hurting, they have no idea why we're doing what we're doing and allowing them to harm, uh, be harmed the way they are. I voted for both, both proposals today. I'll vote for whatever it takes to get us back in a room to make something happen, open the government up. Uh, I'm understanding that the CR works this way. If we have a CR, uh, then there's going to be proportionally three weeks of money still being used for DHS for border security. I understand that's how it works. It's based on 1.3 billion uh, last year as a probes. A CR continues the spending from last year. So there'd be money there to continue on in good faith. I don't think any of us would want to come back three weeks from now and say, it's your fault for shutting it down. No, it's the president's fault. No, it's our fault. No one wants to go through that. I don't know why the three weeks is, is, is unreasonable for anybody if it's presented properly to the president, that you're going to have continuation of money proportionately to the three weeks that we're going to be in that CR. But the thing that I can't understand is I'm hearing that the president wants 5.7. Senator Portman just told us where that came from, from the people who are expertise and should know, Custom Border Patrol people. I'm understanding also, I heard this morning, some of the leadership from the Democrats on the House side saying that they would consider 5.7 but for anything but a wall. That means they know we need border security, but they have a different idea how to secure the border. Well, guess what? If you want to spend 5.7 for a border security, uh, the president wants to spend 5.7 for border security, surely we can sit down in that three-week period and figure out by talking to the professionals what needs to be done where our greatest risks are. How do we stop the, the, the opiates and all the drugs that are coming in? It's ravaged my state. It is horrible what my state is going through. And on top of that, I've got people that are working for the federal government, about 12,000. I have never seen more people impacted. And all they're saying is this. You people really don't care because none of you are hurting. You talk a good game. You play a lot, of, a lot of words back and forth, but no one's hurting. We're the ones hurting. Then I've got essentials working in prisons. And basically, most of our prisons are in very rural areas. The average drive time to our prison is one hour the prison I'm talking about, which is Hazleton, one hour. People are making decisions. They're not, not going to work because they're upset and mad. They know their responsibilities, but here's their other responsibility. They got to make a decision because they got no cash. What little bit of money I've gotten resources, do I put gas in the tank or do I put food on the table for the kids? One of the two. Now we're trying to work out because we don't know how long this is going to happen, how they're going to basically be carpool or transportation, public transportation that we can get. Guess what? Public transportation is starting to shut down too. The buses are starting to shut down. The way that we could get them to work in, mass, in, in masses. But guys, let me tell you, I have been in public service like all of you, and I think we were all in it for the right reason. We wanted to truly serve the public. We're not serving the public, and we're all guilty, every one of us. I don't care how you vote on bills. I don't care what we talk about. We are all getting paid in with the same brush right now. No one's going to escape this. And it is absolutely horrific what's being done. I've always said this, government should be your partner and your ally, not your adversary. And right now, government is the enemy of the people that basically are providing the services that people depend on and protecting us. This is why this has got to stop. So I'm saying to, to the president, Mr. President, please give us the three weeks. We understand we need border security. Basically, our colleagues on the other side understand there should be compassion. When you have a child that was brought here, two days old, two weeks old, two months old, and now is an adult and has no idea how they got here, but they'd like to enjoy the fruits and be able to give something back to this country, there ought to be a pathway forward. 
These are things that we all seem to agree on at certain times. And I, along with uh, many of the senators who were here in 2013, voted for one of the biggest packages we've ever had. $44 billion in security, basically uh, border security, and not one person could get a pathway to citizenship or become a citizen of this great country if they were not here for the right reason. They might have got here the wrong way, but they came for the right reason, should they not have an opportunity. And they could not become a citizen after 10 or 13 years until we secured the border. That's what this was all about. And now we're fighting over whatever. I don't know. I can't even explain it when I go back home. So I tell him, I said, listen, I'm for border security. I will vote for border security. I'll vote compassionately to try to help people find a pathway to be an American citizen also, especially children. The other thing is, I think that we can find a way, a pathway forward. The president will give us the three weeks. And I guarantee you, I don't think any of us will vote for another shutdown or let this happen. But you can't let it go another day longer. We cannot leave here until we fix this. Because the people back home says, any way you're going to fix it, I'll tell you. And when you're hurting as bad as I'm hurting, why don't you all stop your pay? How come you're still getting a pay? Oh, yeah, you fixed that because that's a constitutional amendment. It's, it's, you're taken care of, and it's out of your hands. You can't deny your pay. It's going to come. They says, I'll tell you, this will never happen again if the day that basically a shutdown begins, every congressperson, every senator, all 535, the president and everybody that works in that White House over there that's making policy, everybody's pay stops. I guarantee you one thing, we'll work around the clock. We'll work around the clock to prevent another shutdown. And I cannot, I cannot disagree with him. So I'm saying I'm all in. I am all in. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll stay here 24 seven. I'll do whatever it takes to bring people back together but most importantly, get people back to work. And we can do that and still have border security and have some compassion for the people that hurt the most. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Alaska. Mr. President, that's exactly why we're here, is to get this government open, get people paid, get people back to work. Let me turn to the senator from Louisiana. Thank you. Um, Mr. President. Senator from Louisiana. Mr. President, if I was sitting at home or in the gallery right now, I'd be incredibly frustrated. I'm frustrated, but if I was home, I'd be particularly frustrated. Why? Think of what we agree upon in, these, in this colloquy from both the Democratic and the Republican side of the aisle. We agree that border security is important. We agree that it is one of the primary functions of the federal government. We agree that there needs to be more money. And although in legislation we've not agreed, we certainly have statements from Democrats, of course, as well as Republicans, that barriers are also important. Colin Peterson, a Democrat on the House side, put it well. I'm quoting him, give Trump the money. I'd give him the whole thing. Put strings on it so you make sure he puts the walls where it needs to be. Why are we fighting over this? We're going to build that wall anyway at some time. That was from January 22nd, 2019. And my Democratic Senate colleagues have said something along the same line. Maybe not as point blank, but they certainly have said it. We agree there. We agree that the American worker who continues to show up but is not getting paid needs to get paid. Those TSA agents, those flight controllers that we use as we go back and forth to our districts, God bless them. More than 51,000 TSA agents working without pay. 10,000 air traffic controllers uh, support staff remain furloughed. Um, I, by the way, I and others have introduced legislation to pay those while they are working. And I think it is something we, the Senate, should take up. We need a solution that fulfills our national security responsibilities, ends the shutdown, and these workers get paid. Now, I would say it's time to move forward, negotiate, and come to the table. But you may ask, if Democrat and Republican senators are all agreeing on this, why is it not happening? In fairness to President Trump, whose rhetoric sometimes inflames and sometimes pushes off, uh, and as my colleague from Ohio said, sometimes describe things in a way which misrepresents his actual intent. It is not a wall from the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean. It is a wall in certain places that are high flow with pedestrian traffic. But nonetheless, clearly we've come to a point where a personality conflict between the president and the speaker has put them at loggerheads and apparently unable to negotiate. It's clear from our colloquy that senators on both sides of the aisle would like to come to a solution 
that secures the southern border, opens the government, and pays the worker. And in fairness to the president, he's put forward an opening offer. He has said he wants that money for the barrier, but he's put other issues on the table that are near and dear to Democrats' heart that hopefully would open the way to a compromise. The way I can imagine it would work is that the, uh, the speaker, she would put forward a counter proposal. I think that's where we need to be, to rise above any personal dislike or any entrenched positions that people have come to, but rather come to a point where we recognize that the American people are better served if the folks serving them are getting paid, and that it is important to secure our southern border, and that some sort of barrier will be part of that, as members of both parties have agreed to. So it's time to move forward. It's time to negotiate. It's time for the two principles to come to some sort of compromise. Clearly, we in the Senate are willing to move forward. So, Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. I'm pleased to yield to my colleague from New Hampshire, Senator Hassan. Thank you, Senator Cardin. Mr. President. The Senator from New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. President. I join with my colleagues here in saying how disappointed I was that today's vote to reopen the government immediately while we keep negotiating to address border sec security was defeated. But I am encouraged by the bipartisan group on the Senate floor with me this afternoon to send one clear message. Let's pass a clean three-week continuing resolution to reopen the government immediately. And each of us is committed to working to pass a strong bipartisan border security bill during that three-week period. Like many of my colleagues, uh, I've gone down to the border. I've talked to our frontline personnel on the border. There is a lot of common ground about what we need to strengthen our border security. And I join my colleagues here and thank Senators Cardin and Murkowski for organizing us in saying that we can get to a solution on border security, but we need to open the government right away. There is no reason to keep the government closed while negotiations on strengthening border security continue. And in fact, there, there is concern that negotiations forced by shutdown sets a dangerous precedent. So I strongly urge my colleagues from both parties to support this bipartisan approach. I thank Senators Graham and Cardin, too, for their leadership in this effort. And I'm committed to working with them and the rest of this bipartisan group to find a way forward. Every day, that this senseless shutdown continues, it is hurting people in New Hampshire and across the country. We have all been sharing stories. We have heard the stories. We have talked to the hardworking men and women who serve the people of this country, who are doing their work without pay or are furloughed and really don't know how they're going to make their next mortgage payment, their next utility payment, and put food on the table, get their medication, all of the things that they need a good day's wages to do. So we need to end this now. I join with my colleagues in being here this afternoon to simply say that we need to open the government and that I am committed, as so many all of us are, to negotiate in good faith going forward to find a solution on border security. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Alaska. Mr. President, I turn to my colleague from Iowa. Very, thank you very much, Senator Mur Murkowski and Senator Cardin. Thank you for your leadership today in organizing this floor colloquy, Mr. President. Thank you very much. I do want to join my colleagues in expressing how urgent it is that we not only secure our borders, but that we open our government. We really do have to come together. We've got two sides of the aisle here, our Democrats and our Republic Republican friends. Certainly, we can come to a solution. We've got to figure out a path forward, folks, and I'm glad that we're here to do that. We have a duty to provide for our nation's security, and it's also our job to fund the government. We just voted on a sensible and smart proposal offered by the President that every Democrat and Republican should have supported, but unfortunately, it was rejected today. You know, back home, our hardworking Iowans and, of course, Americans all across the country, they're tired of government shutdowns, and they are disappointed in the dysfunction of Washington, D.C. 
The impacts of this government shutdown are tangible for families. They feel it. People are hurting all across this nation. Most families don't have a rainy day fund. Money only lasts so long when you have zero income. Prolonged periods without a paycheck are unsustainable. I have a friend who works for federal law enforcement, and fortunately, he's, he's up in seniority, but he told me the other day, he said, Joni, our young workers, our young federal workers, they just can't make ends meet. Children don't stop growing, people don't stop getting sick, and the obligations of caring for families don't stop just because we have. Washington has stopped working, folks. We've got to get it together. I've heard from businesses on the brink of collapse. I've heard from first-time home buyers that are trapped in limbo right now. And there are serious consequences that I've heard about from our farmers who work every day with the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA. Our food banks, our churches, and other charities that spend their time and their resources helping families and communities through these tough times, helping those furloughed workers and those who are in need, they're running out of resources. They're running out of time, and it only can last so long. We need our DOJ working to stop crime and violence. We need our vital government agencies back up and running. We can do that. I support a stronger border, and I support the President's sensible proposal, which does include a barrier, manpower, ports of entry, technology, and infrastructure. I think it's necessary that these investments be part of an overall deal. Our lack of border security has resulted in a humanitarian crisis at the border. We have tens of thousands of illegals and inadmissible immigrants on our southern border every month. I agree with President Trump and many of my colleagues that securing our southern border is a must-do to discourage illegal immigration, curb the human trafficking, stop drugs, stop gun trafficking, in addition to stopping the ability of gangs and terrorists to exploit the holes in our system. You know what, folks? The American people expect us to do better. We have an opportunity to step up and do the right thing, and that's find a solution. We have to do it by working together. So again, I want to thank all of my colleagues for coming together today on the floor. Um, again, Senator Cardin, Senator Murkowski, thank you for organizing the effort, and hopefully we will come to a solution. So. Folks, the nation is watching us. We can do better. I'll yield the floor. Thank you to the senator from Iowa. Uh, question to the president in terms of how much time remaining on the Republican side. Six minutes. All right, perfect. We are down to remaining two speakers, and we've got three minutes each. I would ask that Senator Gardner be recognized at this time. The senator from Colorado. I thank the Senator from uh, Alaska. Thank you, Mr. President, for this opportunity to come to the floor to talk about what this chamber needs to do, along with the House, the President, to get this government reopened to fund border security, something that all Americans agree to, that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, that we can multitask, that we can find a way to fund priority spending on the border, that we can find a way to fund 800,000 government employees, including 53,000 federal employees in my home state of Colorado. In 2014, I was elected to the Senate. In November of 2014, we were dealing with the question of whether the government would shut down. Uh, in fact, the first issue that we were asked uh, in the new Congress as we headed back into session was, would there be a looming shutdown over immigration? That's not 2018, 19. That was actually in 2014. Here's what I said then. There's no time, place, or purpose of a government shutdown or default. That's simply ridiculous and something that a mature governing body doesn't even contemplate. We ought to make it very clear that that's simply not acceptable. I said that in 2014. I echoed it in December of 2018. And I stand on the floor today sharing the same belief, sentiment, and value. We need border security in this country. 
we need to have barriers and structures on the border where it makes sense, as the president has said, he's made a reasonable request to put in place border security. But we also have a responsibility to the people of this country to govern responsibly. And that means not jeopardizing our economy, not jeopardizing the firefighters in Colorado who can't go to training right now because the government is shut down. My home state lost hundreds of homes last year due to wildfires. Think about the catastrophes in California across the West last year. Firefighters from around the country were called up to do heroic things in saving entire towns. Yet those very training services, classes, and tools that they need for a fire season that could start any time are being denied the training and the classes that they need to save their own life, to save other lives, and to protect our land. We have farmers who are trying to get production loans right now. Can't get their production loans uh, through certain offices because of the shutdown. Farming's not good right now if anybody, the prices are so low right now, people are struggling. Talked to a farmer in Colorado yesterday, he doesn't know what the bank is gonna say to him on Friday when he goes in tomorrow. He can't get a hold of anybody at the USDA because of the shutdown. We need border security. That's why I voted, voted for both measures today. The $5.7 billion for border security and the, the continuing resolution proposal that contains the President's 2018 budget security, or border security proposal. Both measures included border security. We can do this. It's not that difficult. It shouldn't be a challenge to govern responsibly. Shutdowns aren't the solution. Walking and chewing gum at the same time shouldn't be uh, so difficult. And I hope that this chamber will come to its senses, along with our House colleagues and the White House, to move forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. I would now ask that the Senator from Arizona be recognized. Senator from Arizona. Thank you, and I want to thank the Senator for Alaska for organizing this, uh, and bo really both sides of the aisle, uh, so that we can have our voices heard for those who we represent uh, here on the Senate floor. Mr. President, uh, I came yesterday from Yuma, Arizona, and the day before I was in Nogales, Arizona. Uh, I visited Nogales, the ports of entry, the CBP officers coming to work every single day now without pay. Uh, on Monday, they processed 2,000 trucks through the port of entry there. That cross-border commerce is so important. Uh, for an economy like Arizona and jobs. And they also seized 18 kilograms of methamphetamine and uh, heroin, fentanyl, uh, that is uh, contributing uh, to the opioid crisis and the drug crisis in our, in our country. Uh, they are still, morale is pretty good uh, because they still know how important it is for them to be there on the watch and doing their job. However, this is unacceptable that they're being asked to come to work and not be paid. Uh, as was said by other colleagues, some of the lower level officers, uh, the, uh, the younger individuals early on the job, uh, they, they have no reserves. Uh, and I talked to several of them. They are very concerned about what's going to happen when they miss a second paycheck here in the next day. Uh, when I went to Yuma and talked to the Border Patrol, it was the same thing. They need to be on the job. They want to be on the job. They know how important it is for our country and for border security. I visited the place where just last week 376 people uh, were able to tunnel under where we have a barrier they can't see through uh, so that they, didn't, they weren't able to see it until they actually had breached it. Uh, and they caught a couple of MS-13 gang members yesterday. Again, they're asking, please, let's secure our border. Uh, let's provide the resources for the agents and for the officers and for what they need to do every single day. And let's open up the government so we can do these things. This is why America is so frustrated with Washington, D.C., why many of us ran to come here in the first place. We're like, what is the matter with you guys? Just get it together, get something through the House and the Senate, this can be signed by the President, to open up the government and secure our border. Let's roll up our sleeves, let's stay here all night, around the clock, and let's get this mission done. And I yield back. Senator from Maryland. Over the last hour, many of our colleagues have come to the floor, Democrats and Republicans, with different views about how we should deal with border security issues and how we should deal with the problems at hand, but a common willingness and commitment to reach a bipartisan agreement. 
In order for that to be accomplished, we need time. And therefore, we're following this afternoon a bipartisan resolution, uh, amendment to the underlining bill that will provide three weeks for a continuing resolution for government to be open so that we can work together to deal with the border security issues. I agree with Senator King in his optimism that we will be able to reach an agreement. It's interesting that Senator King's an independent. Uh, th this is, should not be a partisan problem on border security. We should be able to resolve the issues. I want to thank Senator Murkowski uh, for her help in organizing this event. We've tried to work in a truly bipartisan manner in order to give optimism, and I think rightfully so, that we can solve this issue if we have the time to do it. I would urge all of our colleagues to join us in this effort. Let's open government. Let's have three weeks. Let's all be committed to deal with border security in the manner in which this institution in the past has been able to deal with tough issues. With that, uh, Mr. Mr. President, I want to thank again my colleague from Alaska, and I'll yield back the balance of my time. Mr. President. Senator from Alaska. Mr. President, I want to thank my colleague from Maryland and all the senators on the Republican side and the Democrat side who came to the floor after these, these two votes to, to express this, this air of optimism that we can figure this out. One of the things that I heard very clearly from both sides is enough already. Enough already, because that's what the American people are saying about this shutdown. Enough already. Figure it out. Well, we got the message. We know what the mission is, and I think what you've seen expressed here on the floor is the goodwill and the good faith that will be extended in these hours and days going forward, knowing that there is an urgency to get the government open and to address the legitimate priorities that the President has outlined. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor, and I would suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. President. I would ask for the suspension of the calling of the quorum. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, today I rise to continue my series of speeches on Russian hybrid warfare and threat. Uh, with the permission of the chair, the Senator from Maryland, do you wish to speak? Or? No. Okay. Mr. President, as I will continue, I, I have done a series of speeches on the Russian hybrid warfare threat, and it poses a great challenge to our national security. Russian hybrid warfare occurs below the level of direct military conflict, yet it is no less a threat to our national security and the integrity of our democracy and society. One tactic that Russia deploys as a part of their hybrid warfare arsenal, and the one that I would like to focus on today, is information warfare. Russian information warfare it includes the deployment of false or misleading narratives against the targeted civilian population or government, often through deceptive means, in order to intensify social tensions, undermine trust in government institutions, and sow fear and confusion, which advances, advances their strategic objectives. The Defense Intelligence Agency highlights in their Russia Military Power Report from 2017 and I quote, the weaponization of information is a key aspect of Russia's strategy. Moscow views information and psychological warfare as a measure to neutralize adversary actions in peace and to prevent escalation to crisis or war. Russia developed its playbook over time, enhancing both the technical and psychological aspects of these information operations in capability, sophistication, and boldness. Lessons learned from previous information warfare campaigns culminated in the attacks the Kremlin unleashed against the United States during the 2016 presidential election. The 2016 information warfare campaign, according to our intelligence community, quote, demonstrated a significant escalation in directness, 
level of activity, and scope of effort compared to previous operations. Now let's be clear, Russian interference in the 2016 election was an attack on the nation. It was just not a type of attack that has been commonly recognized as warfare. As former Director of National Intelligence Jim Clapper stated recently, it's hard to convey to people how massive an assault this was. While Russian hybrid attacks were directed by, detected by our intelligence community and our national security agencies in the run-up to the 2016 election, the seriousness of the threat was not absorbed across the government, including Congress. There are a variety of reasons for this, including physical, excuse me, political paralysis and a collective unwillingness to believe that these attacks could compromise our political and social institutions. Two years on, we still have only scratched the surface in our understanding about the nature of Russian information warfare attacks. Gaps in our knowledge include the extent to which these attacks have been perpetrated at Putin's direction by Russian military intelligence units known as the GRU and through Kremlin-linked troll organizations. And yet, we have no time to waste. Information warfare attacks continue against us, our allies, and our partners to this day, and they continue to pose a threat to our national security. Former CI director, um, acting director, and deputy director, Mike Morell, characterized the attacks from the Russians against our elections as the political equivalent of 9-11. In the aftermath of the strategic September 11th attacks of 2001, we established a nonpartisan commission to understand what happened and why. One of the 9-11 Commission's conclusions was that the United States government showed a failure of imagination by not anticipating and preventing the 2001 attacks by the terrorists. We have no similar wholesale reckoning in the aftermath of the attacks from 2016. Some elements of our government and society have taken steps to focus attention on this pressing problem. However, these efforts have not been sufficiently comprehensive, and the nature of the threats has not been fully communicated to the American public. As Senior Vice President for the Center of European Analysis, Edward Lucas assessed in a recent New York Times documentary on Russian disinformation, we are still playing catch up from a long way behind. We are looking in the rearview mirror, getting less bad at working out what Russia just did to us. We are still not looking through the windshield to find out what's happening now and what's going to be happening next. We must recover from our collective failure of imagination. We must rethink and refocus our strategy for countering these threats and implement necessary institutional policy and societal changes to support that strategy. And importantly, we must develop a playbook of our own to fight back. While the West has been slow to recognize the extent of the threat, these types of attacks are not new. Historically, information warfare has long been a part of the Soviet and Russian arsenal. As security scholar Kier Gilas noted in his Handbook of Russian Information Warfare, for all of their innovative use of social media and the internet, current Russian methods have deep roots in long-standing Soviet practice. During Soviet times, Infant warfare, warfare tactics were part of a broader collection of operations that were referred to as active measures. The State Department described active measures in a 1981 report as including control of the press in foreign countries, outright and partial forgery of documents, use of rumors, insinuation, altered facts and lies, use of international local front organizations, clandestine operation of radio stations, and exploitation of a nation's academic, political, and media figures as collaborators to influence policies. Active measures were run by the KGB, which at its height employed approximately 15,000 officers devoted to these tactics. The same Department of State report described the strategic rationale for such operations, stating, Moscow seeks to disrupt the relations between states, discredit opponents of the USSR, and undermine foreign leaders, institutions, and values. The tactics of contemporary Russian information warfare mirror Soviet-era active measures, but have gained vastly greater potency in the digital age. 
So this, the irony is, th these are the tactics that the Soviets employed, but they've been supercharged because in a digital age, you can reach more people, you can be more effective. And under Putin, Russia has institutionalized information warfare with a 21st century twist that capitalizes on the interconnectedness of our global society and the speed and reach of today's information age through cyberspace. This has important advantages for Moscow. For example, Soviet-era KGB agents worked for years to get an information warfare camp to, quote, go viral and to be picked up in multiple news outlets. Today, GRU and Kremlin-linked troll organizations spread propaganda and disinformation campaigns across social media platforms with ease, virtually instantaneously. These information warfare operations are not simply opportunistic meddling by Russia. Russia's purpose is to further its strategic interests. Putin seeks to advance several strategic objectives, including preserving his grip on power and enhancing his ability to operate unconstrained domestically or in Russia's perceived, perceived sphere of influence and in its near abroad. Putin further seeks for Russia to be seen as an equal to the United States on the world stage and to regain the great power status it lost at the end of the Cold War. Putin knows that for now, Russia cannot effectively compete with the United States in conventionally military ways and win. Instead, Putin seeks to use tools from his hybrid warfare arsenal, including information warfare, to divide the United States from our allies and partners in the West and weaken our institutions and open societies from within. By weakening our democracy, Putin can make look a, Lake Russia look more powerful in comparison. And it is not surprising that Putin, who spent most of his Soviet career in the KGB and his successor, the FSB, has deployed these techniques during his rule. Putin mourned the downfall of the Soviet Union, lamenting in 2005 that the breakup of the Soviet Union was, in his words, the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. When he assumed power, Putin revitalized a number of methods of hybrid warfare from the Soviet system, including information warfare. Over time, Putin came to see Russia's nearly continuous campaign of information confrontation with the West as both a justified and defensive response to perceived U.S.-led international activism, regardless of our intentions. Kia Giels confirms this idea assessing that Russia interpreted the color revolutions in former Soviet states and the Arab Spring as resulting from information operations by the United States and the West. Those operations were seen as posing a serious and growing threat to Putin's rule. The Kremlin's development of its information warfare capabilities reflects those perceptions and Putin's concern with preservation of his regime. Putin moved from earlier ad hoc information warfare campaigns, such as the operations against Estonia in 2007 and Georgia in 2008, to the systematic application of these tools. Most experts point to the Russians' public reaction to Putin's return to the presidency for a third term in 2012 as the turning point that led to the development of Russian information warfare as we experience it today. It began with the announcement in September 2011 that Putin, then acting as prime minister, and Medvedev, then serving as president, would switch roles. This revelation, coupled with the rigged parliamentary elections in late 2011, created an unexpected backlash from the Russian people. Massive demonstrations ensued, with thousands of people taking to the streets. To Putin, the grievances of the protesters appeared personal as they chanted, Putin is a thief and Russia without Putin. And the year of 2011 was particularly relevant for revolutions and the overthrow of dictatorships. 2011 gave rise to the Arab Spring, in which dissidents relied heavily on Facebook and Twitter, American inventions, to organize their protests and cast off authoritarian governments in places across the Middle East. And again, Putin conceived US actions in places such as Egypt and Libya as proof that the United States actively cultivated regime change. Protests in Russia began to resemble the protests of the Arab Spring, including the similar use of Facebook and Twitter. Putin viewed these activities as a threat to his hold on power. 
around that time, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton raised concerns about the Kremlin's electoral conduct. She urged that the Russian people, like people everywhere, deserve the right to have their voices heard and their votes counted. In response, Putin accused the United States of interfering in the Russian elections and blamed Secretary Clinton for the massive protests taking place in Russia, alleging that Secretary Clinton gave the, in his words, signal to some actors in our country to rise up. He further bemoaned what he called foreign money being used to influence Russian politics and warned, we need to safeguard ourselves from this influence in our internal affairs. After his inauguration for a third term, Putin promoted a close ally and tasked him with getting control over the Russian people's use of the internet. Putin and his cronies also put political pressure on the creators of prominent websites. Those who were not willing to cooperate, such as the owner of the Russian version of Facebook, were pushed out so that the chosen oligarchs could become majority shareholders and then begin to control content. About the same time, the Russian parliament passed legislation helping the Kremlin monitor and criminalize unfavorable cyber activities. In concert with the new online restrictions, the Kremlin began paying bloggers to slip in pro-Russian material amongst other benign posts, which was the beginning of government-directed troll operations. In late 2013, a leading Russian newspaper reported that the tools put in place to co-op new forms of media were recognized as so effective that the Kremlin decided to send these weapons outside to the American and European audiences. This may mark the beginning of Putin's move to institutionalize a more sustained and permanent state of information confrontation with the West. Russia also used these external operations to further develop its toolkit for information warfare. Central to these efforts included what many experts agree was the development of a hybrid warfare doctrine as articulated by the Chief of the General Staff of the Russian Armed Forces, General Valery Gerasimov, in 2013. Gerasimov argued that asymmetric approaches to dealing with conflict, including the use of political, economic, informational, humanitarian, and other non-military measures, have grown and in many instances have exceeded the power of force and weapons in their effectiveness. He further discussed how hybrid warfare tactics including what he termed informational actions, can nullify the enemy's advantage and reduce its fighting potential. One of his conclusions was that it is necessary to perfect activities in the information space, including the defense of our own objectives. About the same time, in August of 2013, RT, which is a Russian television station, reported on Russian plans to create a new branch of the military that would include monitoring and processing external information as well as fighting cyber threats. In the article, Putin acknowledged that information attacks are already being applied to solve problems of military and political nature and that their striking force may be higher than those of conventional weapons. Based on RT's reporting and observation of the GRU's activities, it is clear that Russia has created information warfare troops with no parallel in the United States. These GRU units combine the arts of technical cyber operations with psychological manipulation. Malcolm Nance, a former US Naval Intelligence officer, characterized the GRU as the armed forces of Russia and the intelligence apparatus that does reconnaissance, surveillance, and strategic cyber operations. Russian security services expert Mark Gagliotti explained Historically, the GRU has been Russia's main agency for operating in uncontrolled spaces, which means civil wars and the like. In some ways, the internet is today's uncontrolled space. And in hindsight, we can trace Russia's development and conduct of its information warfare campaign against perceived foreign threats from its neighbors in the West. These campaigns generally progressed along three major lines of effort, all of which benefit from advances in technology from the Soviet days. First, the campaigns involved overt propaganda and disinformation. Much of it carried out on Russian state-owned media, such as RT and Sputnik. The second line of effort involved covert cyber attacks, included hacking and weaponizing stolen information. The third line of effort in the Russian information campaigns 
and evolve weaponizing the internet, particularly social media networks, to amplify messages to a vastly greater audience and promote themes that advance Russia's strategic interests. While Russia's technical and psychological capabilities grew over time, the outlines of this Russian information warfare playbook were evident during Russia's invasion of the Ukraine in 2014 and during the United Kingdom's Brexit debate the following year. But we largely did not understand the extent of these operations and the threat to our national security and that of our allies and partners. Our collective failure to understand the pattern of Russian information warfare emboldened Putin. The Kremlin's tactics and techniques were further refined and deployed in the Russian information campaign against the U.S. presidential election in 2016. Starting in 2014 and 2015, Putin turned his information arsenal first on the near abroad, deploying information warfare operations against Ukraine during the conflict over Crimea and eastern Ukraine. Russia used Ukraine as a testing laboratory for experimenting with new tactics of information warfare through cyberspace and social media. The impetus for Russia's intervention in the Ukraine arose in response to domestic unrest which caused the Russian backed Ukrainian president to flee the country. Events tipped off when Ukrainian President Vita Yukanovich signaled he was no longer willing to continue efforts to integrate Ukraine with the West, which had broad public support. Instead, he accepted a Kremlin offer of a $15 billion bailout for the Ukraine and a deal on gas imports. Protests broke out, which grew into what was known as the Maidan Revolution. The numbers and strength of the protest alarmed the Kremlin. Putin wanted to ensure that Ukraine stayed in Russia's sphere of influence. He deployed hybrid warfare, including a full-scale information warfare campaign to force the Ukrainian people back in line. The goal of the information warfare campaign was to convince the people of Ukraine that they were in imminent danger from fascists and Nazis who were taking over the country and committing atrocities against their fellow citizens. The Kremlin deployed all three lines of effort that I laid out for their information warfare campaign against Ukraine. A barrage of overt propaganda and disinformation, cyber attacks, including weaponizing stolen information, and the manipulation of the internet and social media platforms. These efforts sowed fear and magnified mistrust towards the Ukrainian government, which the Kremlin was able to exploit for the seizure of Crimea and to achieve other Russian strategic interests. The Russian campaign deployed a significant volume of propaganda and disinformation against Ukraine to magnify a climate of fear and distrust amongst the Ukrainian people. Examples include photos doctored to look like scenes of carnage from Ukraine, fake stories of dead children caught in the crossfire, supposed attacks on Jewish Ukrainians who were forced to flee the country, and allegedly a three-year-old who was crucified by Ukrainian soldiers. The messages also portrayed the Russians as the Ukrainian people's saviors and that Russia had to intervene in order to help restore order. The second line of effort, covert military operations in cyberspace, were also deployed as part of the Russian campaign against Ukraine. At the time, attacks against Ukraine were described as coming from Cyber Berkut, which the UK's government's National Cyber Security Center has recently announced is almost certainly the same branch of the GRU that infiltrated the Democratic National Committee. The GRE forces, GRU forces responsible for these hack and weaponized information operations were later named by their unit numbers in Special Counsel Mueller's July 2018 indictment and have been given many names including Cyber Bakut, Fancy Bear, and Advanced Persistent Threat 28. In the spring of 2014, as Ukraine held its presidential elections, Cyber Berkut penetrated Ukraine's, Ukraine's Central Election Commission, directly altering the nationwide presidential vote tallies in favor of Russia's preferred candidate. Ukrainian officials caught the change before the results were announced, although it was broadcast on Russian news that the Russian-backed candidate had won, sowing doubt on the validity of the election and magnifying distrust in the Ukrainian government. Seeing as how they couldn't actually change voting tallies and fully get away with it, Russia's tactics evolved to try to change people's minds about who to vote for or to make the public so distrustful of the system 
that they don't vote at all. These same units began to steal private information through cyber intrusion on Ukrainian government and political officials and weaponizing it by posting it on the internet. As the Defense Intelligence Agency noted in the Russian Military Power Report from 2017, the intent of publicizing the stolen information was to demoralize, embarrass, and create distrust of elected officials. The third line of effort of the Russian campaign focused on leveraging cyberspace to reinforce and amplify their messaging, which was carried out by both the GRU and Kremlin-linked troll organizations. While these efforts were often unsophisticated, this may have been the first time that both organizations embarked on wide-scale social media campaigns to amplify information warfare beyond Russia's borders. The Washington Post reported, based on internal Russian military documents, that the GRU fabricated numerous accounts on social media after Ukrainian President Yanukovych fled in 2014. These accounts on Facebook and the Russian version of Facebook, known as VK, posed as ordinary Ukrainians who were against the Kyiv protests. They preyed on people's emotions, magnifying fear and distrust. One example of a message posted by the GRU from a fraudulent social media account was, Brigades of Westerners are now on their way to rob and kill us. Morals have been replaced by thirst for blood and hatred toward anything Russian. The same GRU unit was also responsible for the creation of the fictitious persona Ivan Galitsyn, who placed pro-Kremlin comments in English language news websites. The intercepted Russian military documents also detailed how the GRU created four fraudulent groups on Facebook and its Russian equivalent to support its campaign in Crimea and used paid Facebook ads to increase traffic to their fraudulent sites. Subsequent reporting by the Washington Post uncovered the specific GRU unit, 54777. The GRU unit responsible for this operation bragged to their superiors that these four groups alone received at least 200,000 views. All of these tactics would appear in later information warfare campaigns. This information warfare campaign against Ukraine also appears to be the one of the first uses of a complementary social media effort, deploying Kremlin-linked trolls against the population of a foreign country to enhance and amplify the GRU operation. A close Putin crony, Yevgeny Prigozhin founded and funded the operation known as the Internet Research Agency and its related company to amplify the Kremlin's messages across social media platforms. According to a Russian press report from 2014, during the Ukraine operations, the Internet Research Agency was employing about 250 people to engage in online discussions with the goal to undermine the authority of Ukrainian politicians and post hate speech and fake stories, thus shifting attention from the real events. Copying the model that the Kremlin developed to manipulate its own citizens, these fake Ukrainian personas would pretend to be regular local Ukrainian people and then slip in politically charged messages. BuzzFeed detailed one such cam entitled Polite People, which promoted the invasion of Crimea with pictures of Russian troops posing alongside girls, the elderly, and cats. The trolls used the innocuous pictures to gain a group of followers. Then they were easily able to pump out pro-Kremlin messages to ready-made audiences. Although the tactics were relatively simplistic, both for who they were trying to reach and the technical aspects of their campaign, the Kremlin information warfare campaign appeared largely successful against Ukraine and contributed to the Kremlin seizure of Crimea. Indeed, General Philip Breedlove, then head of US European Command and NATO Supreme Allied Command of Europe, warned at the time that Russia was waging the most amazing information warfare blitzkrieg in the history of information warfare. Even as these information operations overwhelmed Ukraine, the potential threat they posed to Western societies was largely unrecognized and calls for help in combating these types of campaigns, including manipulation of social media, went unanswered. The Washington Post reported last October that high-level Ukrainian officials, including President Poroshenko, 
personally appealed to Facebook President Mark Zuckerberg in the spring of 2015. One of his de deputies stated that they told Facebook, I was explicitly saying that there are troll factories, that their posts and reposts, promoted posts, and news that are fake have a look. Facebook officials failed to take these pleas seriously and in 2015 declined President Poroshenkov's request to open a Facebook office in Kiev to address the problem. In a foreshadowing of events in the United States, Facebook failed to imagine the significant impact that these campaigns could have on Ukrainian politics and security. Our government, too, failed to realize the full extent of the threat. While we have been able to uncover a lot about Russian attacks on Ukraine, we have not been able to piece together the full picture about what Russia perpetrated against the United Kingdom in connection with the spring 2016 referendum on whether the United Kingdom should leave the EU, commonly known as Brexit. Members of Parliament and others investigating these attacks have been able to piece together evidence that the Kremlin mounted an information warfare campaign to encourage and amplify anti-EU sentiment in the run-up to the voting day. However, because these investigations are limited to their committees of jurisdiction and there is no equivalent to the U.S. Special Counsel's investigation pulling the disparate pieces of information together, we have yet to understand the full picture about what Russia perpetrated against the British people. What we have learned so far indicates that the Kremlin appeared to run a more sophisticated campaign against the British people than the attacks it perpetrated against Ukraine. In this operation, the Kremlin was pushing one side of the argument as they were in Ukraine, but they showcased increased psychological complexity in its attacks. This campaign focused on targeting segments of the British population that would likely be frightened by threats of increased immigration particularly from Muslim-majority countries. The Kremlin and Kremlin-linked actors also pushed messages that the EU was corrupt and had little accountability to the people of the United Kingdom, which magnified feelings of mistrust of the EU. The first line of effort for this Kremlin information warfare campaign, and the one that the West has been able to track and analyze, was propaganda and disinformation. The Kremlin unleashed a slew of overt Russian propaganda in English, advanced on TV and the internet by Kremlin-controlled media outlets. A United Kingdom parliamentary inquiry on disinformation cites 261 articles on RT and Sputnik with a heavy anti-EU bias in the six months prior to the referendum. These outlets advanced a steady drumbeat of stories, stressing the continued dangers as long as the United Kingdom remained part of the EU so-called open borders. This included information intended to magnify fear by alleging that British women would be subject to increased attacks from dangerous Muslim immigrants. It is yet to be determined whether the second line of effort, covert GRU operations in cyberspace, was deployed as part of the Russian campaign promoting Brexit. It does not appear that hacking and weaponizing of stolen data was deployed in connection with Brexit. However, as detailed in a separate parliamentary inquiry, on the night of the deadline for the Brexit referendum, there was a suspicious crash of the voter registration website, likely attributed to denial of service attacks. The timing of this attack appears consistent with other GRU covert cyber attacks, which aim to take key infrastructure or information offline at crucial times to advance Kremlin objectives. This crude information warfare tactic has been tied to GRU in previous operations, particularly in Eastern Europe. Further, the UK government has been able to tie the GRU to other cyber attacks, including attacks on United Kingdom television stations and the United Kingdom Foreign Office. If these Russian actors were culpable in this denial of service attack, it would fit with the Russian playbook. The third line of effort, the use of cyberspace to amplify and reinforce messaging featured prominently in the information warfare campaign related to Brexit. While we don't know what role, if any, the GRU played in this line of effort, we have been able to identify a sustained campaign on social media against the British public by Kremlin and Kremlin-linked actors. These attacks included the use of trolls and automated bots amplifying pro-leave messages ahead of the date of the referendum. 
The New York Times reported that tweets from the Russian accounts sought to inflame fears about Muslims and immigrants to help drive the vote. Tweets surged in the last days of the campaign, spiking from about 1,000 tweets a day to 45,000 tweets in the 48 hours prior to the polls closing. In the final days before the referendum, less than 1% of Twitter users accounted for one-third of all the conversations surrounding the issue, showing that these actions were artificially boosting the pro-leave messages to increase viewership size. Joint analysis from Swansea University and the University of California, Berkeley, concluded the attacks emanated from 150,000 Russian-based accounts and that their tweets were viewed hundreds of millions of times. It must be noted that Russian amplification efforts in connection with Brexit also received a boost from local surrogates in the UK. One pro-leave local surrogate was Nigel Farage, the leader of the right-wing populist UKIP party. Whether unwitting or not, Farage echoed aspects of Russian propaganda, including lending his voice to stories broadcast on Russian propaganda channel RT, Farage was also often quoted in Russian media articles, including when he warned that British women could be at risk of mass attacks by gangs of migrants due to big cultural issues, should Britain choose to remain in the EU. Again, echoing the message that Russian agents and authorities were promoting. Here, too, it seems, we have just begun to scratch the surface of our understanding about what the Kremlin was doing including how they had insight into who to target with their information warfare campaign. Member of Parliament Damian Collins, who is leading an investigation into Russian disinformation and connected to Brexit, fears that what we know at this point about the extent of the Russian attack against the British people, quote, may well be just the tip of the iceberg. We can't point with all certitude to whether the Kremlin's information warfare campaign made the difference in the outcome of the vote. However, we know that those who voted to leave the EU won by a small margin. It was a stunning upset that no one expected, let alone then Prime Minister Cameron. He cited the outcome as the reason for his resignation. The Kremlin has also turned these weapons on the United States. The most prominent example was the sustained, multi-pronged information warfare campaign deployed against the American people, as I've stated, during the 2016 presidential election. While the Kremlin's information warfare campaign against Ukraine and Brexit supported and amplified one side of the issue, for this operation, Russia showed increased technical and psychological advances by targeting multiple aspects of contentious issues to advance the Kremlin's objectives. Grievances about race, religion, immigration, social justice, and even U.S. institutions writ large were woven into anti-Clinton, pro-Trump fabric. These efforts were a toxic mix trying to poison Clinton's candidacy, promote Trump's favorability, taint the electoral process, and weaken democratic institutions altogether. Similar to the information warfare campaign against Brexit, we're still trying to get a full picture of how Russia attacked us during the 2016 election, and particularly the role that the GRU played. But what is now clear is that the Kremlin's information warfare campaign regarding the 2016 election was not neutral or even-handed in its messaging on Clinton compared to that of President Trump. As affirmed in the intelligence community's January 2017 assessment, in their words, Putin ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the U.S. presidential election, the consistent goals of which were to undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton, and harm electability and potential presidency. They also assess that, in their words, Putin and the Russian government developed a clear preference for President Trump. Similarly, Director Mueller's February indictment against the Kremlin-linked troll operation found that the Russians, quote, engaged in operations primarily intended to communicate derogatory information about Hillary Clinton to denigrate other candidates such as Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and support Bernie Sanders and the candidate Donald Trump. The clear anti-Clinton and pro-Trump themes in Russia's efforts aligned with Russia's strategic interests. As mentioned earlier, Putin blamed Hillary Clinton for protests in Russia in December 2011. 
weakening Clinton as the candidate would reduce the perceived threat to Putin's grip on power from a Clinton presidency. President Trump, on the other hand, offered Russia a freer hand in conducting its affairs. And similar to Brexit, the Russian information warfare campaign against the American people in 2016 demonstrated a high degree of sophistication in targeting susceptible groups of Americans, potentially including the use of data analytics. We are still learning details of how the Russians were able to build an audience for its information warfare attacks, and whether they had any help from any Americans. However, Justice Department indictments, including those from the Special Counsel, and two reports commissioned by the Senate Intelligence Committee analyzing data provided by social media companies are providing a better picture of the information warfare campaigns against us. One of those reports, a joint study by Oxford University and the social media analytics firm Graphica, assessed that the Kremlin-linked troll organization was able to segment users into different groups based on race, ethnicity, and identity. Once they categorize people in such a manner, they tailored ads to entice users to engage with their fraudulent accounts and pages. This process engineered messages to manipulate and polarize receptive audiences. The other study, commissioned by the Center and Intelligence Committee, a collaboration between the social media research firm New Knowledge, Columbia University, and Canfield Research, confirms this idea detailing how specific ethnic and racial groups were targeted. Their analysis concluded these operations were directed overwhelmingly at African Americans. As Washington Post technology reporter Craig Timberg explained, social media companies created this technology and the process of atomized us into different categories and put us into a thousand different buckets. The Russians co-opted this American technology, just as they have exploited other aspects of our open society and democratic system and weaponized it against us. And similar to campaigns of the past, this information warfare operation followed the three established lines of effort as detailed in the intelligence community's January 2017 assessment. The Kremlin's campaign followed a long-standing Russian messaging strategy that blends covert intelligence operations, such as cyber activity, with overt efforts by Russian government agencies, state-funded media, third-party intermediaries, and paid social media users or trolls. The first line of effort involves overt propaganda and disinformation, focusing on a number of themes that advance Russia's strategic interests. Having tested their methodology in previous campaigns, including in Ukraine and Brexit, the Russians had an arsenal of tried and tested methods of influence that they deployed in the U.S. presidential election to maximize fear and distrust. Propaganda and disinformation to stoke these negative emotions were pumped out by Kremlin-funded channels RT and Sputnik. They sought to flood an unsuspecting American public with stories portraying Secretary Clinton as untrustworthy and dangerous, thus amplifying negative feelings towards her. Articles painted Clinton as a warmonger who would lead the United States into future conflicts, or alleged that she was in ill health and hiding her condition from the public. Additional reports were aimed at bolstering the perceptions that she was not trustworthy and accused her of nefarious dealings detailed in the emails she deleted as a cover-up to her so-called crimes. A third group of accounts alleged that Clinton used her high-ranking position as Secretary of State to enrich her family foundation with foreign donations by engaging in quid pro quo schemes. In contrast, Kremlin-funded media pushed positive stories about President Trump, promoting him as a pragmatist who understood the United States needed to stop interfering in the internal affairs of other countries. An additional widely used theme, which sought to maximize feelings of distrust and ran through much of what Kremlin media broadcast, revolved around corruption in the United States, American hypocrisy, and that our elections were rigged and fraudulent. Painting the American political system as unfair, biased, and tainted served Putin's strategic interests, allowing the Kremlin to counter pro-democracy forces within Russia by asserting a moral equivalence between a flawed American democratic system and his autocratic rule in Russia. The second line of effort in the Kremlin's information warfare playbook covert Russian operations in cyberspace, repeated tactics used against Ukraine, but this time with greater sophistication. 
In particular, the Kremlin and Kremlin-linked actors engaged in hacking and weaponizing the release of stolen data. From what our intelligence community, the Department of Justice, and FBI have complied, pump, compiled, it appears that the GRU undertook the largest share of this aspect of the information warfare campaign with complementary efforts undertaken by the FSB. The special counsel's indictment for July 2018 detailed how the GRU, quote, intentionally conspired to gain unauthorized access into the computers of U.S. persons and entities involved in the 2016 election, steal documents from those computers, and stage releases of the stolen documents to interfere with the 2016 U.S. presidential election. As we now know, two of the main targets of this operation were the DNC and Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta. Press reports indicate that approximately 50,000 emails and documents were stolen. Once in possession of these stolen documents, the GRU repeated its playbook from earlier campaigns. It sought to weaponize the hacked information by releasing it in a manner and at key times when it could cause the most damage, while concealing Russia's role in the process. As the Mueller indictment against the GRU describes, they did so using fictitious online personas, including DC leaks and Guccifer 2.0. The Mueller indictment from last July further details the GRU's use of fake persona, Guccifer 2.0, which the GRU falsely claimed was a Romanian hacker. Guccifer 2.0 released stolen documents and was active in promoting so-called exclusives of stolen information as a way to launder it to third parties, including journalists from traditional media outlets. The GRU's covert efforts also took advantage of willing amplifier WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks had an established reputation for spilling state secrets, including those of the United States government and military. WikiLeaks also offered a ready-made audience and had an understanding of how to time releases for political impact. Indeed, according to the Mueller indictment, the GRU, posing as Guccifer 2.0, quote, discussed the release of the stolen documents and the timing of those releases with WikiLeaks to heighten their impact on the 2016 presidential election. WikiLeaks released the stolen documents during the Democratic National Convention to cause conflict between Clinton and Sanders supporters at a time when many Americans were very likely to be paying attention. WikiLeaks also released documents in the last few weeks of the election, again, when the nation was very likely to be following the campaigns. The first release of stolen emails from Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta coincided with a warning from the Department of Homeland Security and Office of the Director of National Intelligence in October 2016 about Russian attacks against our election. It also occurred on the same day as the release of the Trump Access Hollywood tape. These efforts, too, suggest a high level of sophistication that had been seen in earlier Russian influence campaigns. The third component of the Russian information warfare campaign message amplification and reinforcement through social media was deployed in parallel with the other lines of effort to achieve an unprecedented impact. While we don't know the full extent of the GRU's involvement, the Mueller indictment revealed that an entire military intelligence unit, 74455, was active in this line of effort. In his July 2018 indictment, the special counsel explained that unit 74455 assisted in the promotion of the released stolen material and the publication of anti-Clinton contact on social media accounts operated by the GRU. That includes the site DC Leaks, which was in fact established by the GRU. It went live in early June 2016, posing as a site run by American hacktivists, promising to expose the truth about US politicians. The GRU even created a DC Leaks Facebook page authored by the fictitious US woman, Alice Donovan which sought to drive traffic to the site. The July indictment further details that the GRU used additional fake accounts posing as Americans named Jason Scott and Richard Gingray to promote the DCL, DC leak site. Before we shut down in March of 2017, the DC leak site was viewed over a million times. The GRU also used social media to magnify fears about Hillary Clinton. The July indictment from the special counsel revealed that GRU was the true operator by the fraudulent Twitter account at Baltimore is War, which encouraged U.S. audiences to join our flash mob, 
opposing Clinton and share images with the hashtag blacks against Hillary. In addition to the GRU weaponizing social media against the United States, it was a complimentary effort from the Kremlin troll organization, the Internet Research Agency. By the 2016 US presidential election, the deployment of the troll organization appeared to be a standard part of the Kremlin's playbook. The October 2018 indictment of the Internet Research Agency's accountant in the Eastern D District of Virginia provides additional information of the troll organization's role in the information campaign. The indictment confirms the existence of the agency's operation known as Project Lakta since at least May of 2014 and notes that this project targeted Ukraine, Europe, and the United States with a stated goal in the U.S. to spread distrust toward candidates' political office and the political system in general. Social media researchers, including P.W. Singer, have also noted how some of the same trolls were repurposed for different operations. The accounts who pretended to be Ukrainian then posed as British citizens and then Americans as the focus of attacks shifted over time. Against the United States, the troll operation capitalized on issues of importance to groups inside American society to magnify fear and distrust in ways that align with the Clermont's strategic interest of hurting Clinton and helping President Trump. As the special counsel's February indictment details, these groups and pages, which address divisive US political and social issues, falsely claimed to be controlled by US activists when in fact they were controlled by Kremlin-linked trolls. The indictment further asserted this was the manner in which the troll organization reached significant numbers of Americans for the purpose of influencing the presidential election of 2016. The report prepared for the Senate Intelligence Committee by New Knowledge, Columbia, and Canfield, analyzing certain data from social media companies, identifies a number of tax, tactics employed by the Internet Research Agency in its assault on the 2016 elections. These include building brands across platforms, including Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, deploying or repurposing popular memes to spread propaganda, reinforcing key themes by reshaping the same story across multiple accounts, and impersonating local media on Twitter and Instagram to win the trust of Americans in their local news, and amplifying conspiratorial narratives among both left and right-leaning audiences. As I mentioned, the report found that one of the troll organizations' concerted lines of attack was against African Americans. These efforts, however, went beyond just trying to sow discord and reinforce fears about Clinton. Campaigns against African American groups were pushed across Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube with the goal of suppressing voter turnout through malicious misdirection, candidates' support redirection, and turnout depression. Kathleen Hall Jamison, a scholar who studies political campaigns, examined polling data throughout the campaign and documented similar tactics at different disenfranchisement in her recent book, including fake ads that encourage minority viewers to text or tweet their support for Clinton rather than voting at the polls, or rallying support for other candidates in the race. These efforts may have been particularly effective in peeling off voters that would have been likely to vote for her candidacy. They also may have influenced undecided voters at a key time. Polls in the final month of the campaign showed a marked drop in the number of Americans saying they intended to vote for Secretary Clinton. The reports prepared for the Senate Intelligence Committee highlight that Twitter was an important component of the attacks Kremlin-linked troll organizations deployed against the American people. The nearly 4,000 inauthentic Russian Twitter accounts, like their Facebook counterparts, promoted messages related to divisive social issues such as gun control, racial relations, and immigration. The troll organization also deployed bots or automated accounts to amplify messages and drive traffic to specific Facebook pages, Kremlin propaganda sites, or other targeted websites. The Kremlin linked troll operation went into overdrive on election day with strategic messaging, which mimicked the spike in activity on Twitter during the Brexit referendum. According to the Daily Beast, Kremlin linked trolls began a final push and used a combination of high profile accounts with large and influential followings and scores of lurking personas established years earlier with stolen photos and fabricated backgrounds to send carefully metered tweets and retweets voicing praise for Trump and contempt for his opponent 
from the early morning until the last polls closed in the United States. And as the recent studies commissioned by the Senate Intelligence Committee illuminate, the information warfare campaign against the American people was an extensive, widespread, coordinated effort across many social media platforms, both big and small. The increased sophistication of the troll organization techniques on social media provided a relatively low cost but highly effective method of influencing the American public. For example, these trolls spent only $100,000 on 3,000 ads on Facebook. While this may seem like a small amount compared to the millions of dollars spent on the presidential campaign, the impact and reach of these Kremlin ads, once amplified through these Russian operations, was extensive. While Facebook estimates that approximately, approximately 126 million Americans saw Kremlin-linked messages, Jonathan Albright, the research director for Columbia University's Tau Center for Digital Journalism, extrapolated they could have been shared hundreds of millions and perhaps many billions of times. Kathleen Hall Jameson concluded that the widespread reach of the troll organization's disinformation increased the likelihood that Russian activities changed the outcome of the election. A study from the Ohio State University on propaganda and disinformation affirmed Hall Jameson's assessment and concluded Russian information warfare attacks most likely did have substantial impact on the voting decisions of a strategically important set of voters, those who voted for Barack Obama in 2012. Indeed, given the very narrow margin of victory in key battleground states, this impact may have been sufficient to deprive Hillary Clinton of a victory in the Electoral College. That's their conclusion. As with the Brexit campaign, the Russian information warfare campaign during the 2016 election was aided by others who either wittingly or unwittingly helped to advance Russian strategic objectives. Among these were major American news outlets, which covered much of what was in the WikiLeaks disclosures, treating it as legitimate news without reminding viewers of how the information was obtained or that it was being pushed by a foreign adversary. Thomas Ridd, a professor of security studies at King's College, testified to the Senate Intelligence Committee in March of 2017 that the journalists functioned as unwitting agents who aggressively covered the political leaks while neglecting or ignoring their providence. Or as Kathleen Holt Jameson concludes, the American media inadvertently helped the Russians achieve their goals. Further, as in the Brexit campaign, a number of local surrogates appeared to echo the Kremlin message. This included associates of the Trump campaign, and even the president himself. He boasted of his love of WikiLeaks at least 124 times in the last month of the election alone, and even tweeted a link to access, access the stolen disclosures of WikiLeaks. And according to the Washington Post, at least five close Trump associates, albeit perhaps unknowingly, retweeted messages from Kremlin-linked troll accounts, including the account at 10 GOP, a Russian fake handle that impersonated the Tennessee Republican Party. The president of the campaign also used talking points, similar Russian propaganda and different information, including disparaging Secretary Clinton's health and accusing her repeatedly of being crooked. The president encouraged Russia in many respects to continue these activities. And from what we now know from the July indictment from the special counsel, the night that Trump called on Russian to hack her emails, the GRU did in fact attack the server that housed Clinton's personal emails accounts. As journalist and legal analyst Jerry Jeffrey Tubin characterized it, all these separate Russian efforts are completely aligned with Donald Trump's interest, often word for word. Some have argued that despite this intensive and sophisticated Russian influence campaign, there was no effect on the outcome of the election because no vote tallies were changed. While we never, may never know definitively what the actual impact of the Kremlin's operation was, it is hard to believe the Kremlin would mount a sustained multi-year information warfare campaign against our democratic institutions if they had no reason to expect that it would have an impact. To the contrary, based on their experience in Ukraine, Brexit, and elsewhere, the Kremlin had every reason to believe they could successfully influence the outcome of the 2016 election with minimal risk of being discovered or retaliation. As I have laid out, Russia is engaged in a sustained information warfare campaign against the United States our allies and partners. This Russian interference can't be dismissed as a one-off operation. As Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein told the Aspen Forum last July, the Russian effort to influence the 2016 presidential election is just one tree in a growing forest. 
Russian intelligence officers did not stumble onto the idea of hacking American computers and posting misleading messages because they had a free afternoon. It is what they do every day. Our intelligence community assessed in January 2017 that the campaign against us represented a new normal in Russian influence efforts in which Moscow will apply lessons learned from its campaign aimed at the U.S. presidential election to future influence efforts in the U.S. and worldwide. Russian information warfare operations have a real and ongoing impact on our national security. Russia has not poised its information warfare operations since the 2016 election, and in fact, the level of Russian operations has increased since then. John Kelly, the founder of Graphica, a social media intelligence firm who testified to the Senate Intelligence Committee in August and who collaborated on one of the reports for the Senate Intelligence Committee I discussed earlier, stated, after Election Day, the Russian government stepped on the gas, confirming again that the assault on our democratic process is much bigger than the attack on a single election. This idea was confirmed by data in both his report and other reports commissioned by the Senate Intelligence Committee on the Kremlin-linked troll organization. The report done by New Knowledge, Columbia University, and Canfield Research noted that the Kremlin-linked troll op organization went after those who are investigating Russian information warfare and other malign influence activities in the United States, including attempts to label Russian interference in the election as nonsense, and casting former FBI Director James Comey and Special Counsel Mueller as corrupt. We don't have to look too far for other examples of Russia's ongoing campaign against the American people and our allies and partners. Kremlin-linked troll operations flooded Twitter with messages intended to sow division and disinformation in the wake of numerous controversies, including the tragic shootings in Las Vegas and Parkland, Florida, and during the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings. Last September, we learned from an indictment in the Western District of Pennsylvania that GRU officers, including some agents previously indicted by Special Counsel Mueller, attempted information attacks against prominent world organizations, including those who are investigating Russian malign influence activities. It's now clear that Russian information operations also targeted the 2018 midterm elections. The October indictment from the Eastern District of Virginia details an ongoing and advanced operation to influence the American electorate up through 2018. As the indictment states, this campaign has a strategic goal which continues to this day to sow division and discord in the U.S. political system. The indictment also details how Russian troll operations are using U.S.-based virtual private networks, or VPNs, paid for with Bitcoin through multiple bank accounts to disguise the origin of Russian messaging on social media. The sophistication of these operations continues to increase. The Internet Research Agency has a dedicated search engine optimization department which is devoted to manipulating social media search algorithms to advance the goals of Russian troll operations. The troll organization spent millions of dollars annually in 2017 and 2018 and are still buying ads on Facebook and Instagram. These operations continue to cover a broad range of divisive issues, and as the indictment details, the organization's employees are instructed on strategies and guidance for targeting particular audiences with carefully tailored messages. And despite efforts by Facebook and Twitter to eliminate inauthentic accounts, there are still thousands of active social media and email accounts appearing to be U.S. persons when they are, in fact, Kremlin-linked trolls acting as a part of an information warfare campaign. Last February, testimony before the Armed Services Cyber Subcommittee, Russia expert Heather Conley warned that Russian information warfare campaigns in 2018 and 2020 will adapt and look more American and it will look less Russian. The New Knowledge, Columbia University, and Canfield Research Study notes that we need to be on the lookout for increasingly sophisticated operations, including increased human exploitation tradecraft and narrative laundering. Already the technology exists to create deep fakes, false videos of real people saying or doing things that are damaging. Advances in artificial intelligence are enabling rapid automated responses on social media that mimic authentic accounts. We are still gathering data about information warfare attacks, including during the 2018 midterms. Between the indictments I referenced and the additional Kremlin-directed troll operation discovered by Facebook in conjunction with our intelligence community, the FBI and DHS, we seem to be getting better at responding to the types of attacks perpetrated against the U.S. in 2016. 
but that is no indicator we've become better at anticipating future attacks. The director of the Department of Homeland Security, Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency warned last November the 2018 midterm is just the warm-up for or the exhibition game. The big game for adversaries is probably 2020. I want to thank my colleagues for being generous and, and patient with my presentation. But I do want to make, a, 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 I think, a, a, an important concluding point that ties in directly to what is going on right now. We've been talking about this shutdown. Um, after I've described the activities that has transpired over the last five to 10 years, we should be aware that they're continuing. And the consequences of this shutdown are more than theoretical. We are missing some of our most critical tools for countering Russian information warfare and protecting systems that are vital to our democracy. As Andrew Grotto, a former cybersecurity advisor for President Trump and Obama stated, defending federal networks is already an act of triage. Furloughs make a hard job even harder and while I applaud DHS for reorganizing into the new cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency, they have since had to furlough 43% of their employees. That's over 1,500 workers who are right now unable to continue key missions and protect us from attack. The FBI is also affected by the shutdown and critical function related to countering Russian hybrid and information warfare. A recent FBI Agents Association's report highlighted how efforts to investigate and prosecute cyber criminals have been impacted. That includes a lack of resources to pay for wiretaps and subpoenas. One anonymous FBI agent quoted in the report remarked, these delays slow down our work to combat criminal activity on the internet and protect the American people. All the while, Russia continues to attack us with information warfare. They are not closed for business. With this unnecessary government shutdown, we are fighting blindfolded with one hand tied behind our back. I am confident in the ability of our government and our society to come together. I am confident that with American vision and ingenuity working across the aisle and across the Atlantic, these are challenges we can meet and conquer. We must remember this is not a Democratic or Republican problem. This is an attack against the nation by our foreign power. This is a problem of our national security. We have no time to wait. And if we're looking for another reason why should we open this government immediately, it's to continue our protection against our tax by foreign entities. With that, let me particularly thank the Senator of Florida for his patience and thank the President for his patience. And Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Florida. I rise today as a voice for the people of Puerto Rico. I intend to be their voice, their voice in the United States Senate. They are Americans, as American as the people of Florida that I was elected to represent. They are our brothers and sisters, and they deserve a voice. Their success is America's success. Their recovery is America's recovery. In September of 2017, Puerto Rico was, a hit, was hit by a devastating hurricane. Maria's landfall changed the landscape of the island forever. As governor of Florida, I worked to be there for the people of Puerto Rico. I worked with Congresswoman Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, Governor Rossello, Lieutenant Governor Luis Rivera Marin, Senate President Thomas Rivera Schatz, and House Speaker Carlos Johnny Mendez to provide whatever support and aid they needed. Jennifer has been a tireless advocate for Puerto Rico, and she's been fighting so hard for this funding. I'm proud to join her in this fight. In Florida, we created welcome centers at the airports in Orlando and Miami to support those coming to Florida from the island. We waived housing and education regulations to make sure families coming from Puerto Rico could easily settle in Florida, whether they plan to stay permanently or just for a short period of time. I visited Puerto Rico eight times since the deadly storm and provided Florida state resources to the citizens of, citizens of Puerto Rico to aid in rebuilding and recovery. But the island still has a long way to go. The bill I support today does many good things. It reopens the government after the longest shutdown in US history. It provides significant funding to secure our southern border. Funding that is long overdue is needed to keep American families safe. It extends protections for children that were brought to this country illegally through no fault of their own and extends TPS. 
While I would prefer a permanent solution for the DACA kids and TPS, this is a positive step. Putting protections for the DACA uh, population into law is also long overdue. The bill also provides significant disaster funding for the state of Florida, following the devastation of Hurricane Michael, which hit Florida's panhandle just a few months ago. The funding includes resources specifically for Tyndall Air Force Base. I would like to thank Majority Leader McConnell for putting a bill forward to help Florida recover from this horrible hurricane. On all of these points, I join many of my colleagues in support. But unfortunately, the Senate version of the government funding bill does not include $600 million in essential disaster funding for our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico. I'm offering an amendment today that would add the $600 million, including the House bill, back into the Senate version. Puerto Rico's recovery continues, and the United States Congress must do everything we can to support that with responsible safeguards against fraud and waste. As long as I'm a member of the United States Senate, I will fight to make sure the people of Puerto Rico are represented. I'm proud that the First Amendment I filed in my first speech in the Senate floor is to fight for Puerto Rico. To the people of Puerto Rico, know this. I will be your voice in the United States Senate. I will fight for what's right, and I will never give up. Mr. President, I will now address the Senate in Spanish. I provide translation to the Senate for the record. La gente de Puerto Rico merece un cambio real. Tenemos que fortalecer la economía, economía de la isla. Como senador, lucharé para las familias de Puerto Rico y trabajaré para asegurar que Puerto Rico se ha tratado de manera justa. Muchas gracias. Mr. President, the amendment is at the desk. I yield back the balance of my time. Senator from Hawaii. Thank you, Mr. President. It has been 34 days since the President fulfilled his promise to shut down the government. And the American people are not happy about it. Poll after poll shows that people are not OK with the way that the President of the United States is handling his job, and it is getting worse by the day. Because to any reasonable person, this shutdown has been stupid and useless and cruel. There are so many failures to talk about, but I want to talk about four specific failures that if it was any other president, if it were any other time in modern history, would bring a president and a Congress to its, sentence, uh, to its senses and end the shutdown. And the first failure is this. Federal workers are in food lines. Federal workers are in food lines. People with jobs are now in food lines. Hundreds of thousands of people who work for the government are either furloughed or working without pay. And tomorrow, these American public servants will miss their second paycheck. And there's a big difference between missing the first paycheck and the second paycheck. Some people can absorb missing the first paycheck, but this second paycheck is going to be really, really challenging for tens of thousands of American public servants because the rent is due, the mortgage is due, the car registration is due, the insurance is due, the utilities are due at the beginning of the month. This brings the amount of money that American public servants are owed by their government for work already performed to $4.7 billion. And remember that about a third of all federal workers are veterans. It may be hard for billionaires in the cabinet to understand, but for the middle class, missing two paychecks in a row is a total disaster. Now, I've met people working in airport security who can't concentrate. They can't sleep because they can't stop worrying about how they're going to pay their bills. I've met government workers in the midst of applying for food stamps and asking local charities for help. I met a single mom who spent her career working hard to build a life for her family, and she told me that without this 
these paychecks, it's all going backwards. As one Washington Post columnist put it, under Republican leadership, the United States is starting to look like the failed Soviet system, with middle class workers literally waiting in bread lines. I'm grateful that for every story I've heard of someone suffering, there's also a story of people stepping up to help. In Hawaii, in particular, local utility companies, financial institutions, and others have decided that they will not penalize federal workers hurt by the shutdown if they miss a payment. And so I want to thank our local banks for allowing unpaid federal workers to make a late payment on their mortgage without a penalty. And I want to thank our credit unions for extending very cheap credit. I want to thank people who are organizing in local communities, not just in Hawaii, but across the country, so that middle class families can make it through this. But federal workers want paychecks, not food banks. They want paychecks. They don't want charity. They want to be compensated for the work that they do. They shouldn't rely on pop-up kitchens for furloughed workers or online fundraising campaigns or the kindness of family, friends, and strangers. As great as all of that is, they should just get paid. And that starts with opening the government. Here's the second failure that should end this shutdown right away, and that is that economic growth is already slowing. This week, a White House advisor said that the nation's economic growth could be zero if the shutdown goes on. Economists and business leaders were already worried about the potential for a recession, and this shutdown is fanning those unfortunate flames. Small businesses can't get loans. Companies can't go public. This administration has stopped some of the core functions of our market economy. But there is one thing that won't stop, and that is the corruption in this administration. If you have money, this administration takes care of you. And if you won't, they won't. If you don't, then they won't. Federal workers have been called back to the office to take care of oil and gas leases, to take care of oil and gas leases and help financial institutions. They're working unpaid so that special interests can keep making money. And this is the third failure. While people who are fortunate financially are protected, this shutdown leaves the people most vulnerable to fend for themselves. Food pantries and health clinics that rely on federal funds are out of supplies, which means that Americans are going to start to go hungry and without medicine for everything from diabetes to addiction. Landlords who provide housing for 4 million people mostly seniors and people with disabilities and kids, will soon stop receiving rent payments. They'll have to decide how long they can hold out before being forced to evict these people or lose the properties themselves. Housing authorities are delaying the release of Section 8 vouchers. Domestic violence shelters that rely on federal funds are furloughed, furloughing their own workers and cutting back services that save lives. So men, women, and children who need to get out of a dangerous situation at home have fewer options to get to safety. And that brings me to the fourth failure, which is that public safety is gravely at risk. This is a serious matter. This isn't about whether Donald Trump can save face or whether the Republicans can uh, vanquish the Democrats or Nancy Pelosi makes you know, uh, uh, Mitch McConnell look bad. It's none of that. Public safety is at risk. Air traffic controllers and TSA workers are working without pay. They are stressed out. And they are becoming increasingly understaffed and undersupported. And new employees, there's no ability to train them. And they are sounding the alarm. This isn't my rhetorical flourish. I want you to listen to what the National Air Traffic Control Association said yesterday. Quote, we cannot even calculate the level of risk currently at play, nor predict the point at which the entire system will break. It is unprecedented. The National Transportation Safety Board is being forced to choose which crashes to investigate and which not to, leaving us with unanswered questions and risking lives in the future. As of this week, the NTSB has been unable to investigate 87 crashes, including some with fatalities. This is a pattern. It's a pattern of recklessly endangering the safety of Americans. We're just two months out from a wildfire that destroyed 18,000 homes 
and buildings and killed 86 people, and yet the shutdown has stopped us from training firefighters. It's canceled controlled burns. It's led to dead trees piling up in places that we know pose a fire risk. And this is what happens when you shut down the government to try to get your way. You put real people at risk. The safety of Americans abroad and at home is threatened by this shutdown. The State Department canceled a border security summit. This fight is supposed to be about border security, and yet we are not paying TSA. We are not paying FBI agents. We are about to close at least some of our federal courts if this shutdown continues. And the State Department itself just canceled a border security summit. FBI agents are working without pay. Field offices are operating in fiscal uncertainty, and that means investigations into street gangs and drug dealers are on hold. Trainings on child abductions and counterterrorism have been canceled. Communications with sources about gangs, such as MS-13, have stopped. As one agent put it, quote, our enemies know they can run freely. Our enemies know they can run freely. So I ask all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, why would we put public safety at risk? Why can't we reopen the government and negotiate our differences? And the truth of the matter is, as it relates to border security, I'm in my seventh year in the United States Senate. And every year we do a bipartisan bill that includes border security in the Homeland Security Appropriations Subcommittee. We always do this. And by the way, every Republican and every Democrat will quietly say, yeah, we're not doing a cement wall from sea to shining sea. That makes no sense. And nobody at the Department of Homeland Security thinks that's a good idea. And so we quietly appropriate money, some for personnel, some for beds, some for um, uh, courts so they can adjudicate some of these cases, and some for physical barriers, right, where it's appropriate. You put up a wall where it makes sense. You don't put up the wall where it doesn't make sense. We do this all the time. And so the idea that we're going to shut down the government and shut down portions of the Department of Homeland Security itself in order to get to a place so that the President of the United States can save face is just absurd. We've got to be the grown-ups here. And that's going to require some Republicans to uh, craft a border security package with Democrats like we have over the last six or seven years. And we've got to do that after we open the government. And the reason that that is so essential is that this president especially, certainly this president especially, but no president, no president, Democrat, Republican, now, 30 years from now, should ever inflict pain on the American people in order to generate leverage on a policy discussion. When somebody does that, and if it's one of my friends in the Senate and they do this 10 years from now, I want someone to read this speech back to me. Because the answer to the, to the offer, which is, I'm going to hurt Americans unless you do X, should be, you get nothing. In exchange for not hurting Americans, that is not a cookie for us. And Barack Obama learned that lesson the hard way. Only when he finally said, you guys want to screw with the American economy, you want to mess with the debt ceiling, you get nothing. And they backed off. And all that brinkmanship stopped. But every time we reward hostage taking, we will get more hostage taking. And so as painful as all of this is, we have to stand firm. We are absolutely willing to negotiate a package related to border security, which will no doubt include some physical barrier. Because we do that every year, actually. But I'm not doing any of that until the government is open. And that's not just a political position. That is a matter of principle, because we can't live like this as a country. We cannot function like this. If we do this, if we cut a deal now and we give them $2 billion for the wall, debt ceiling is coming up in March or April. Here we go again. Fiscal year expires in September. Here we go again. And we will never govern, and I know the presiding officer was a governor. That's just no way to run a country. Let this be the last shutdown. Now, I know the two leaders uh, of the Senate are in what appear to be constructive conversations. I know there are plenty of adults that want to get us out of this. And for the first time in several weeks, 
I've actually felt somewhat hopeful about the trajectory. I don't think we're going to fix this you know, in the next hour or so, but at least we're talking, and at least there seems to be a desire to structure an off-ramp. But we just have to do one simple thing first. We have to reopen the government. People are about to miss their paychecks for the second time tomorrow. It is our obligation to reopen the government. I yield the floor. This is of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Senator from Florida. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Tonight, I wanted to spend a few moments addressing um, recent events in the nation of Venezuela. But before I do, I want to take the opportunity to congratulate the presiding officer, my colleague from the great state of Florida, who a few moments ago, I believe, gave his first speech on the floor of the Senate and uh, did part of it in Spanish and did it very well and uh, spoke about the important issues of Puerto Rico and his leadership here on that's going to be critical. It's an issue I know he knows very well uh, from his time as the governor of our state. And so, uh, and I know this is another cause that he cares about. And he was, uh, his, took leadership on it as the governor of the state of Florida. And as recently as two nights ago, uh, was with me and some others together, we met with the President of the United States to talk about what's happening in Venezuela. The, the most important answer that we have to have to the American people is why should it matter to us? Why should America even be involved in this? beyond expressing an opinion or sending a letter or even a vote at an international organism, why should America lead and why should America be so intricately involved in something going on in another country? And that's always a valid question. It's the most important question we have to consistently answer and not take for granted. I think we don't do that enough anymore in American foreign policy. And it has allowed some to argue that perhaps the United States gets too engaged around the world. The we are a nation that should always stand for our principles, and we should defend them, and we should stand with those around the world who share the principles of human liberty and dignity and freedom and respect for human rights. But when the United States gets deeply involved in something in another country, it must also be in our national interest. And so the only reason why being involved on the issues that are going on in Venezuela could be justified to the men and women of this nation for whom we work is to prove to them and argue to them and convince them that what is happening there is not just about Venezuela, but it is in the national interest of the United States. Before I can do that, I have to kind of lay out the history of what brings us to this point. And I won't go into great detail because time does not permit it. But Venezuela has a constitution. In fact, it has a constitution that was put in place during the rule of Hugo Chavez, someone who I was certainly not a fan of and who was not a fan of the United States. But under that constitution, there was a parliamentary body, the National Assembly, and there was a presidency, and there was a Supreme Court. And what happened a few years ago is that when Chavez dies and Nicolás Maduro, the current dictator of the country, takes over, he has to stand for election. And before he stood for election, there was an election to the National Assembly. And the party that was Hugo Chavez's party and now Maduro's party was trounced. They lost badly. They didn't just lose the National Assembly, they lost governor seats across the country. And Maduro realized that his party and he himself could not survive in a truly democratic system. And so what he did is he canceled the National Assembly. First, he just started ignoring them. He stopped following their orders. You know, they'd pass a bill and he just wouldn't implement it. Just completely ignore it as if they didn't exist. And then he replaced the Supreme Court with hand-picked people that would do what he wanted to do. So the equivalent would be if the President of the United States decided that no matter what law we passed, even if we overrode a veto, he just wouldn't implement it. He just refused to do it. And then at some point, he actually tried to create an alternative to the National Assembly. He created out of thin air this thing called the Constituent Assembly which is an idea he got from the Cubans and from communist countries, and gave them extraordinary powers to do all sorts of things. And one of the things that Constituent Assembly did is they created an election last, late last spring. Now, people would say Maduro stood for election and, and he won, theoretically, at least that's their argument. But it wasn't, you can have an election and it not be a real election. For example, every one of the media outlets in the country is controlled by the government. All of them have to run by law. They're mandated to provide what they call network coverage across the board anytime he speaks to the nation. The opposition party doesn't have that same opportunity. He uh, manipulated vote tallies. And they're able to go in and make sure votes are counted in a certain way. 
They control votes through the food program. 42% of the people in Venezuela depend on a food program run by the government. To have that food program, you have to have an identification card. When you go vote, that same identification card doesn't just register whether you voted or not, they know who you voted for. They know who you voted for. And so if you didn't show up to vote, and you didn't vote for who they wanted you to vote for, meaning Maduro, you got cut off from your food program. And if you had to choose between voting for someone you didn't like and not feeding your family, you're going to vote for someone you didn't like. But despite all that, the turnouts were abysmally low. The, the, figure, the images that came out, there was like two people in line in some cases. Sometimes they caught the same five people making the line over and over again. It wasn't a real election. By the way, he disqualified, legally disqualified, every credible opponent he could have possibly had. And because it was a fake election, the opposition boycotted it. So he didn't even have real opposition. So he wins this fake election, and then comes January, he tries to be sworn in, and he does through this ceremony, but it's not legitimate. It would be as the same as if the President of the United States announced that he's calling new elections not in 2020, we're going to have them in April of this year. And if he wins, he's going to get to serve six years instead of four. And everybody here would say, well, that's not the Constitution. The Const it's not a constitutional election. That's what they did. So it's not a real election. And under the Constitution of Venezuela, because that was not legitimate, you have a vacancy in the office of the presidency. And under the Constitution of Venezuela, similar to ours, when there was a vacancy in the presidency, and by virtue of that, the vice presidency, because it was elected alongside, the president of the country becomes the equivalent of our Speaker of the House. The same line of succession we have here becomes the president of the National Assembly. And the President of the National Assembly assumes that charge as interim president and within 45 days has to call valid constitutional elections. And that's what happened yesterday. The valid president of the National Assembly called, assumed the responsibility of interim president. And now within the next 45 days, he will have to schedule and call for elections. Now, the United States responded to that by stating the obvious, this is not constitutional, it's not legitimate, we don't recognize this fake president, we recognize your constitution and the president that the constitution says is in place, this interim president. This is not a guy who's trying to be president himself for six years, this is not a fight between two political parties, not some civil war like we see in other parts of the world between two competing bands, this is basically the person who has been elected the President of the National Assembly, assuming an interim position, who is now a caretaker to guide the country back towards constitutional democracy. And the United States recognized it. And it is stunning to see some of the reporting on this here and around the world, that, that he basically proclaimed himself the President. No, he just assumed his constitutional responsibility. That uh, the United States did something unusual in recognizing him. Number one, it's not unusual. It's the Constitution of Venezuela. And number two, it wasn't just the United States. We were immediately joined by 11 countries in the region. That number is now up to 16. In the Western Hemisphere, Colombia, Chile, Peru, Brazil, Argentina, Honduras, Guatemala, all of them lined up and more, lined up and reflected the exact same position that the United States has taken on this issue. So did France. Apparently, so did the United Kingdom today. And Albania, and Kosovo, and a growing number of countries. Even the European Union says Maduro's illegitimate. They haven't gone as far as to recognize uh, the, the interim president as the interim president, but they have said he's illegitimate and that the National Assembly is legitimate. So it's not unusual. It happens to be the global norm. Who disagrees with us on this other than Maduro? Cuba, Turkey, Russia, Iran, Egypt, apparently. What do they have in common? Think about it. These are not democracies, and they have their own interests here at heart. Some might ask, well, why does this guy hold on to power if he's so terrible? Well, number one, he controls access to food. And I can tell you, if you control access to food and medicine, and you threaten people with hunger, you'll have a lot of control. The other thing he's done is he uses migration as a relief valve. It's a very Cuban regime type tactic. It is estimated that over 2.3 million people, basically one out of 12 Venezuelans, have left the country since 2015. Think about that. One twelfth of the population has abandoned the country, leaving behind, in many cases, children on their own, leaving behind catastrophe. 
And so the ability to drive out opponents and people for whom life has become too miserable is a relief valve. The other is just sheer repression. They put people in jail, they kill people, the people die in custody, they shoot them in the streets. That's pretty effective too sometimes. The second thing that keeps them in power is the assistance of the Cuban regime. And every time I mention that, people think, well, you're just obsessed with Cuba, you're from Miami, Cuban-American. The, the Cubans, when it comes to intelligence and repression, punch way above their weight. They are experts at repression. And that is what they basically assist them with. Do you know the Cubans basically run the security apparatus of Venezuela? The personal security of Maduro or Cubans, which tells you a lot about how much trust he has in his countrymen? The Cubans provide them basically all of their intelligence collection and the capacity to collect intelligence. They've trained their National Guard on crowd control. By the way, none of this is free. These are not free services. This is a country that is poor and low on resources. The Cubans are probably pulling in a billion dollars a year for these services they provide. The other thing people keep mentioning that keeps them in power is he has the loyalty of military officers. And I know you'll see the picture of all these guys in a country, by the way, where people are starving. Every single one of these military guys is overweight. Somehow, in a starving country, these people are gaining weight. And they have these fancy uniforms on. But let me tell you, these folks are not truly loyal to Maduro. I saw that picture today, and I can tell you for a fact that more than half of the people in that picture at some point in time have expressed serious doubts about Maduro. But they are really limited in what they can do right now. Why? First of all, because all of them, is every single one of them is compromised. Their loyalty is not ideological and it's not personal. It is bought, it is paid for. Because every single one of them has access to lucrative corruption opportunities. Some of them have been given the opportunity to raid Venezuela's national oil company. And they've made millions, hundreds of millions of dollars by running that company into the ground. Some of them have been given the distribution of consumer goods, watches and phones and consumer articles. They, they give them these things that you guys go out and sell them in the black market in the street and you take your cut. Others have been allowed to skim off that food program I mentioned that feeds 42 percent of the people. The military officers get first dibs at some percentage of it and they get to sell food directly for a profit. Some are participating in currency manipulation. It sounds a lot like an organized crime ring, like one of these old style mafia families where one guy ran the loan sharking racket, the other guy had the gambling, the other guy had the prostitution, the other guy did the bank heists. That's what this is. These people are loyal because Maduro allows them corruption opportunities. They're also loyal, by the way, because the Cubans are spying on them. The Cuban intelligence agencies quickly pick up on any of these military officers that are being disloyal or expressing doubts, and those guys are arrested. There has been a massive purge of Venezuelan military officers over the last two years. I'm talking about dozens of high-ranking military officials either removed from their positions or arrested and are in jail. And it wasn't for corruption, believe me. It was because the Cubans caught them and reported them, and they were wrapped up, and everybody else is watching that and saying, it ain't going to happen to me. That's not really loyalty, that's fear. You could see it in their eyes today. And by the way, they resent the Cubans, these military officers. Imagine for a moment, this is your country, and here comes the smaller country, and their guys run everything and tell you what to do and spy on you and, and have pitch you against each other. But they better be careful about expressing that resentment because the Cubans are listening and they'll report you. Despite all this, all is not good for the Venezuelan regime. In fact, it's gotten harder and harder every day because what's happened with the sanctions that have been imposed on these individuals, it has cut off their ability to steal money and enjoy corruption. And it's cut off the ability to enjoy the money that they've stolen. They can't travel, they can't buy certain things, they have to hide their money. Some of them have had assets seized here and abroad. And that's created resentment and that's created anger within the inner circle. And so all these people in the inner circle are now upset because they're not making as much money off corruption as they used to make. And they start saying to themselves, maybe we got to get rid of Maduro and get a new godfather or mafia head here. And Maduro finds out about it and he eliminates them. And so the circle gets smaller, which actually works to his benefit because with shrinking resources, the less mouths you have to feed with corruption, the better. The, um, there's a real good example of it. There's a guy named Diosdado Cabello. 
who ostensibly is now the president of this fake constituent assembly. He happens to be a drug lord, uh, deeply involved in narco trafficking. That's, I guess, his part of the uh, corruption deal. That he, that's his take. That's the business line he's been given. But he also wants to be president. He wants to be president, not Maduro. Interestingly enough, this guy Cabello, when Chavez was removed in a coup that lasted just a couple days, 12, 14 years ago, Cabello swore in as president of Venezuela because there was a vacancy using the exact same provision of the Constitution that they now claim is illegitimate. But here's this guy Cabello, who's a drug dealer, a drug lord, a thug, and but he wants to be president. He'll never be elected president of Venezuela in a, in a normal election, in a legitimate election. So what's his path to being elected, to becoming president? Well, the first is this constituent assembly he's put in charge of. This new thing they created outside the Constitution is so powerful that it could, it, could, it has the power to remove Maduro. They could remove Maduro. And this guy hears the whispers. Believe me, these guys are not blind to what's happening. They can see the country's in disarray, the economy's collapsing, there isn't enough money to steal for all of them anymore. And there are people saying to him, hey, why don't you move on this guy? Because this guy's never going to fix this place. And he's thinking about it, and he's thought about it. But he knows the only way he'll ever be president is, is if he can preserve the outlines of this regime and just get rid of the godfather and proclaim himself the godfather, the head of this new criminal syndicate. Um, or he could just wait till 2024 and run in a rigged election, again, set up under the confines of this regime. So even if he doesn't like Maduro, it's to his benefit that the guy stays there until he's ready to make his move on him, or until 2024, when he could run under this rigged up system. What else is wrong with Venezuela is they're deeply in debt. They have serious problems. These are the things he's hearing about. They owe China about $18 billion which they don't have the money to pay. They owe Russia about three or four billion. You know how they're paying that right now? With oil. They are sending oil to China and to Russia with pennies on the dollar. That's what they're making because they don't have cash. So they're bartering it instead, paying their debts off in oil. Now, I know you've seen the public pronouncements. The Chinese just want to get paid. They're owed $18 billion and they want to get paid and they want to make sure that Maduro is in power, or whoever is in power, someone who's going to pay him the $18 billion. But the Russians want to get paid too. Neither one of them believes Maduro is a great leader or happy with him. They just don't know what's going to come after, and they're afraid that whatever comes after is going to say, we don't really owe you this money, it's not legitimate, because it wasn't approved by the National Assembly. And so they'd rather have this guy in place until, unless it's going to be someone else just like him. But they're not happy. The corruption and the national oil company is so horrifying that even the Chinese and the Russians don't like it. That's how bad it is. And that's got to be a pretty high standard. Then there's the mismanagement. They've destroyed this company. Its production has collapsed. I mean, it's not run by oil people. It's run by generals that don't know anything about the business. They've run it into the ground. And they've missed payments. Remember, they're supposed to be delivering oil for payment. They've missed deliveries to the Chinese and to the Russians. They're not happy about it, but what are they going to do? At least they're getting paid something. Russia has another interest, by the way, which leads me now to why we should care about it. First and foremost, I can make to you a very compelling argument, I believe. That's what's happening in Venezuela is a national interest threat to the United States and even potentially a national security one. Let me just start with this one. Maduro has repeatedly and openly invited the Russians to establish both a naval and an air base in Venezuela. He basically said, here's the land, we'll build it for you, we want you to have your airplanes, we want you to have your naval ships stationed here. Now most of us serving here, with some exceptions, have never served in Congress and many people around do not remember a time when foreign military was stationed an adversary was stationed in our own hemisphere. But that's what Maduro's inviting him to do. Why does Maduro want it? Because he thinks that acts as insurance against ever having an invasion or whatever he thinks is going to happen. Why does Russia want it? They want it because it's leverage against us. They don't like how close we are to them in Europe with our allies in NATO. So this gives them an opportunity to have the equivalent of it in our own hemisphere. 
And so if you think that having Vladimir Putin is a good thing, having him in our hemisphere, stationed with his military here, is a good thing, well, then I suppose what's happening in Venezuela wouldn't bother you. But the enormous majority of Americans do not want Vladimir's military anywhere in our hemisphere. And that's precisely what will happen if Maduro remains in power. That alone is a national security threat to the United States. But there's more. In their own national territory, the Maduro regime hosts a group called the ELN, which is a terrorist narco organization. In fact, last week, the EL ELN detonated a bomb at the police academy in Colombia and killed 20 people. You know where they're headquartered? Inside Venezuelan territory. And it is from there where they plot these attacks. You know what else Venezuela does with the ELN from within Venezuelan territory? They help them ship cocaine to the United States of America. Now, I can tell you both of those are national security interests to the United States. The first is that drugs are a threat to this country, and anyone who is helping a drug trafficking organization ship it into our country is a threat to us. So if you don't mind or don't care about cocaine being shipped in growing quantities into the United States, then I guess Maduro and Venezuela is not something that will bother you. But if you do not want to see people around that are helping drug organizations ship cocaine into the United States under the protection of a government, under the protection of a government, meaning they're giving them controlled airspace, they're protecting their shipments into the U.S. and into Europe, if that troubles you, then Maduro's a problem. One of our best partners in fighting drugs in the hemisphere is Colombia. But Colombia right now is being overwhelmed. They don't have enough money to dedicate to the anti-drug cause at a time when the cocaine production, the growth of coca and the production of cocaine, I should say, in Colombia is at historic levels, three years running. Where do you think that cocaine is headed? A lot of it's headed to our streets. That will be on top of fentanyl and heroin and all the other problems we have. We are going to have a cocaine crisis in this country because all that cocaine is headed here. Colombia is out there trying to fight against it. But their resources are being drained because they have at this moment at least a million, probably 1.2, 1.3 million Venezuelan migrants who have had to leave Venezuela and are now in their territory. Listen, if the United States suddenly absorbed a million migrants over a 12 to 18 month period, we would struggle to afford what that would entail. Imagine Colombia, whose economy is a fraction of the size of ours. And that means instead of being able to spend money fighting the drug cartels to prevent them from bringing the drugs here, they've had to dedicate resources to the humanitarian costs of housing over a million people and growing. It's not just Colombia, by the way, that's being compromised. Ecuador, about 160, 170,000 Venezuelan migrants. Peru, 350,000 Venezuelan migrants. These people are not bad. They're not criticizing the migrants. But these governments, these are not big governments. Some of these governments have budgets smaller than most of our states. They cannot afford this. And it is, it is threatening to collapse their public health system, which means you may not just have a humanitarian catastrophe in Venezuela. We may soon have a growing economic catastrophe in Brazil, in Peru, in Ecuador, and in Colombia. Multiple countries in our hemisphere and geography matters. That would be a terrible thing if it's happening in Africa or halfway around the world. It would directly impact the lives of Americans and our economy and our well-being because of how close it is to our country in multiple ways. And so if you think that having a humanitarian crisis in multiple countries in our hemisphere, including countries aligned with us in the war against drugs, then you should care about what's happening in Venezuela. So what's the road forward now? After, because it, I, I hope people have been compelled to at least understand that this is about more than just caring about democracy. That's a big part of it. We do, and I'm proud of it. But it's about more than just that. This is in the national interest of the United States. And we should be proud, not just of the bipartisan support in favor of the interim president and of democracy in Venezuela. We should be proud of the job that the National Security Council, the White House, and the State Department have done. Because unlike 25 or 30 years ago, this wasn't some unilateral American action where we went in there telling everybody what to do. 
This is international organisms like the OAS. Today, the Secretary of State appeared at the OAS personally to argue the American case. And he was joined by 15 other countries who voted on a resolution agreeing with our principles on this and their principles. The leadership of these countries under the auspices of the Lima Group has been extraordinary. The U.S. is an equal partner to them in this endeavor. But what's going to happen now is Maduro is probably going to, instead of he being the one that arrests the interim president, he's going to say, I'm going to turn over to the courts and let them decide. Well, he controls the courts. These guys are all cronies. They're also corrupt, by the way, sanctioned by the U.S. government. So he could very well move to try to arrest the interim president, Juan Guaido, which is tonight, tomorrow, the next day, although the eyes of the world are upon him and the consequences for that would be extraordinary and severe. You're, gonna, you're already starting to hear them talk about, let's have negotiations. This is a tactic they have now used repeatedly, and they use it because they know we all like negotiations. Everybody, any times an international crisis, why don't we all just sit down and negotiate our way through this? And ideally, that would be the outcome. But he doesn't really want negotiations. He wants a delay tactic. He's done this now multiple times. There were negotiations from the Vatican, and they gave up. Then the former prime minister of Spain was involved in some of these negotiations. Those were a total catastrophe. He's just doing this to buy time. Now he's talking about Mexico and Uruguay being the host of a negotiation. I wouldn't be surprised if soon he says, why doesn't Russia come in and be the interlocutor? How about that for a national security threat and a national interest threat? Having Vladimir Putin brokering political agreements in the Western Hemisphere, Putin would love it. He fancies himself a great global leader. And um, you're going to see him do that, but it's all an effort to buy time. He has no intention of negotiating anything. Because it buys him time to do what? It buys him time for his fake constituent assembly to change the Constitution towards one-party rule, or even potentially to call new flash elections at some point for a new National Assembly under this fraudulent election system he set up. And to many people, they'll say, oh, they had an election, the opposition lost. But it won't be a real election if the candidate people that could win aren't allowed to run, you're not allowed to advertise, you have no access to the media, they control the ballot box, and they extort people with access to food. At some point, I wouldn't be surprised to see him declare a state of emergency. Maybe go out there and trigger some fake incident false flag where agitators go out and commit violence and he'll say the protesters are out of control, state of emergency. Why would he do that? So he can paralyze the streets, no one can be out there protesting, and if the opposition tries to leave their homes, now he has a pretext to arrest them. But there really is only one way forward, and that is to do everything we can to strengthen the legitimate interim government, and that began today. The interim president, his first request was for humanitarian aid to help bring food and medicine and medical supplies to the people inside Venezuela. The Secretary of State of the United States immediately announced that as an initial step, we are going to provide immediately $20 million. I know they're working through how to deliver that into Venezuela and how to position that so the Venezuelan people have access to it. This is on top of and apart from the aid we're already providing the migrants in Colombia and in other places. That's a good first step. On day one on the job, the interim president, Juan Guaido, made a request of the international community, and America immediately stepped forward. And I believe very shortly, in a matter of days, there will be significant humanitarian aid, food and medicine, awaiting the people of Venezuela, either within their own territory and distributed through the Red Cross or some other non-governmental organization, or just across the border where they can access it. We, we have to continue to make clear to the elites in that country that there is no future for Maduro that there is no way that he can hold on, and they need to begin thinking about who their loyalty should be to, the Constitution they swore an allegiance to, the people they live among, or some guy whose future is about to come to an end. I think it's important that the National Guard know that not only should they not repress the people, but they'll be held accountable if they do. And ultimately, I believe this deeply. I know that the generals and all the guys at the press conference with the fancy uniforms have sworn allegiance, although you notice how nervous they were. But I can tell you the rank-and-file fighters do not. You know why? Because the rank-and-file soldier and the mid-level officer in the Venezuelan military, they don't have corruption deals. They're going just as hungry as everybody else. They have massive rates of desertion, people just abandoning posts. 
And when you saw the images yesterday of the hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, you know that many of those soldiers had mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and loved ones and wives and children in that crowd. And you know who else knows that? The military brass. And I know for a fact that they have significant doubts. In fact, they probably do not even believe that if they ordered the military to act against their own people that the military would. Because there's no way that these rank and file soldiers are going to shoot on their brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and love other loved ones. So we need to step forward and continue with the humanitarian aid. We need to help use the leadership of the United States to put together a reconstruction aid. And we need to help the interim president with whatever he needs to be able to carry out a legitimate, free and fair and internationally supervised election, which he should call for in the next 45 days. This is the path forward. It's in our national interest. It's the right thing to do. It reflects our values, but it also reflects our interests as a nation. And that's why this matters. That's why we should care. This is not halfway around the world. This is in our own hemisphere. Just a few hours flight away. And it impacts more than just one country. It impacts an entire hemisphere. And I'll close with this. There's been a, a lot of criticism historically over the US role in the Western Hemisphere. During the Cold War, the criticism was that we were supporting right-wing dictators fighting off communism, that we were involved in coups, and that we had a heavy hand and got in and imposed ourselves. Then we went the total opposite. And for many, many years, in fact, up until very recently, no one even talked about the Western Hemisphere. And to the extent we did, it was about migration and drugs. It was almost, frankly, a complete abandonment of the portfolio. What you're seeing now is the potential birth of a new Latin America, a new Western Hemisphere, one in which the United States is an important partner, but not a unilateral actor. When you see 16 countries in this hemisphere come together with the economic and diplomatic weight of Peru and Chile and Colombia and Argentina and Brazil, when you see the OAS come alive after years of frankly not playing them, when's the last time any of us here even discussed any of the things happening at the OAS? you start to see the beginning of not just a way to confront the crisis in Venezuela, but of a hemispheric partnership whose impetus may have been this crisis, but creates a path forward that's in our national interests. Imagine if, in fact, the democracies and free people of this region came together not just to tackle dictatorships, but to tackle drugs, to tackle the root cause of migration. Imagine a hemispheric 16, 18 regional nation response to what's happening in El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala that's causing these people to undertake this dangerous journey with their children in many cases. Imagine if it wasn't just the United States, but us working in partnership with all these other countries to tackle these hemispheric challenges. I'll tell you, that's in our national interest. And not only is this an opportunity to do the right thing in Venezuela, it's an opportunity to give the start to a new hemispheric reality, a new Latin American reality that serves the national interests of this country and allows us to live in a hemisphere that is free and prosperous, where people do not have to abandon their homelands, where people can stay in their countries if they so choose and raise their families and not have to undertake dangerous journeys to other countries for fear of their lives. But we have to start somewhere. And I can think of no better place to start than on behalf of the people of Venezuela who have suffered terribly for far too long under a dictatorial, corrupt regime who has tortured their children and murdered their fathers and mothers and denied a once prosperous country the future they deserve. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Recognize the Senator. Uh, Mr. President, I come to the floor today to implore my colleagues and the President uh, to end the shutdown and reopen the federal government. We are now on day 34 of this shutdown, which is well past being the longest in American history. You think about what our country has been through. Civil War, World War I, World War II. You think about uh, what we had with protests, what we had with the country uh, in the Depression, what we had only a decade ago with the biggest downturn since the Depression. 
through all of that, even through a few shutdowns, we somehow, in this chamber, and in the House, and in the White House, we're somehow able to get our act together, and we're somehow able to keep the government open. Now is the time to open the government, Mr. President. The 800,000 federal employees who are not being paid are keenly aware that this is the longest shutdown in record. Another sad milestone is coming. If the shutdown continues through tomorrow, these workers will miss yet another paycheck. These are workers like a federal prison worker in Rochester, Minnesota, who noted to me that the inmates were getting paid, but the prison workers are not. And she was so excited to get this job a few months ago. Her child was in daycare. She's a sh single mom. And now she has to decide between taking some other job and moonlighting. What does she do about the daycare? If she takes her job out of daycare and stays home with her child, which would make some sense, except she wouldn't have enough money, then she would lose her spot in the daycare. It's very hard to get daycare in Minnesota. So instead of working on those kinds of what I would call opportunities at a time when our economy has been stable after we've gotten out of the downturn, we have been working out of chaos. So instead of helping her to afford childcare and figuring out smart solutions or doing something about pharmaceutical prices or doing something about college costs or training our workers for the jobs of today and tomorrow or enacting comprehensive immigration reform. So in my state in our rural areas where we don't have enough workers on our farms and in our fields and in our factories, we should be working on those opportunity issues. Instead, we're trying to crawl out of chaos. We need to reopen the government and get these workers back on the job providing vital services for the American people. Once it is open, as my colleagues have made clear, as leadership has made clear, we can continue negotiations with the president about border security. I am someone, as did my colleague from Pennsylvania, we voted for a bill that had over $40 billion in border security that was part of comprehensive immigration reform. We did this. But was it a wall through the entire border? No, it was not. It allowed the experts to decide where there should be technology, where there should be fencing, where there should be barriers, where there should be personnel. That's the way to do this. There is no reason that our federal workers and the American taxpayers who rely on the vital services provided by the federal workers should be held hostage while these policy negotiations take place. The pain that this shutdown is causing is real, and it is getting worse. The administration has implemented many creative measures to try and blunt the public outcry against the shutdown, but these measures are being held together by duct tape. We use duct tape a lot in Minnesota. We try to put things together, but we shouldn't be using duct tape to tape together our entire government. Our agencies are running out of money, and many are reaching the breaking point. Earlier today, the five former secretaries for the Department of Homeland Security, including our first DH secretary, Tom Ridge, and John Kelly, President Trump's former chief of staff, President Trump's former chief of staff, let me say that again, just recently, his chief of staff, wrote a letter urging an end to this shutdown and full funding for the Department of Homeland Security. In their letter, the former secretaries noted that Congress always prioritizes funding of the Defense Department as a matter of national security. Quote, Congress does so because putting national security at risk is an option we simply can't afford. DHS, Department of Homeland Security, should be no different, end quote. While the administration continues to explore ideas like a national emergency declaration to bypass Congress, the irresponsibility of all of this is breathtaking. Yesterday, the presidents of the National Air Traffic Controller Association, the Airline Pilots Association, and the Association of Flight Attendants released a terrifying joint statement pointing out the risks that the shutdown presents to air travel. These leaders state, in our risk-adverse industry, well, that is putting it mildly, we cannot even calculate the level of risk currently at play, nor predict the point at which the entire system will break. It is unprecedented. I have talked to the air traffic controllers in my state. I have talked to those TSA workers that sit there every day and do their job without pay. In this letter, they go on to state that the air safety environment is deteriorating by the day. 
Reading this statement does not give me confidence, nor does the fact that a full 10% of our Transportation Security Administration agents are now missing work because of financial limitations, meaning they can't cover the daycare and transportation expenses required to come to work. Those who can come to work are surely distracted by worries about how they will pay their bills. As a member of the Senate Commerce Committee, I worked with my colleague on both sides of the aisle last year to reauthorize the Federal Avi Aviation Administration. We were rightly proud of the law, including the third title, simply titled Safety, which had 90 individual provisions designed to maximize the safety of air travel for the American people. We required updated safety training procedures for airline professionals, sought to improve safety on our nation's runways in rural areas, and updated the laws regarding engine safety. This matters a lot in my state. Uh, we are a major hub in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. We are the state uh, that manufactures jets up in Duluth at Cirrus. Uh, we are the state that has major Minnesota National Guard facilities uh, that train a flight inspectors and aviators and people all over the country. Aviation is incredibly important in my state. In our bill, we required updated safety training procedures for airline professionals sought to improve safety on our nation's runways and rural areas. As a senator from Pennsylvania and Florida know, rural airlines in our states are key rural air service, I should say, and we also updated those laws. Yet we are now hearing that the entire system of air travel may break. For what? What does air travel have to do with border security? The short answer is that air travel has nothing to do with border security, except when we are checking our airports and making sure that they're safe when there are border flights. If we are talking about a wall across the southern border, that has nothing to do with our airports in Minnesota and in Pennsylvania and in Florida. I have long favored increasing our border security through smart technology, and as I mentioned, our 2013 immigration bill, which passed this chamber with a number of Republican votes, many of them are still here. That included money uh, for an additional 40,000 border patrol agents, um, and as we know, most drugs come into this country through our ports of entry, and if we want to do something about uh, the various problems with the drugs coming into our country, things like heroin from Central America and from Mexico, and things like other opioids, then we should be doing something about those ports of entry. As has been the case all along, there are proposals on the table that will reopen the government and end this senseless shutdown. The House has now passed legislation that would fund the government under any number of arrangements. This includes bills that fund all remaining government agencies through the end of the fiscal year. Bills that fund individual departments and agencies, most having absolutely nothing to do with this debate that is raging with the White House, or I should say, raging in the White House. This last bill that was passed on February 8th, short-term basis that would have taken us through February 8th, would have allowed the President and Congress to negotiate a longer-term proposal. That was a bill that we passed in the Senate. This last bill was even coupled with additional funding for disaster relief, a priority for both parties that wish to help Americans in states that have suffered through hurricanes and wildfires. Earlier this afternoon, the Senate voted on this short-term funding proposal. While the proposal did not gain the required 60 votes to gain consideration, I was encouraged by the fact that five Republican senators joined Democrats in voting to consider this bill. This is progress, and we need to build on that momentum by working together to do the right thing for the American people. On Monday, we celebrated Martin Luther King's life. And one of the things that Martin Luther King once said was, it is always the right time to do what is right. This is the right time. We can't just keep waiting while government agencies remain shuttered. There are 6,100 federal workers in the state of Minnesota who are not receiving their paychecks. Farmers, small business owners, and taxpayers are going without vital services from their government, major portions of which have been closed for 34 days. It's time to reopen the government. I yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. I recognize the senator. 
Mr. President, I rise to talk about the shutdown as my colleague, the senior senator from Minnesota, just did, and grateful for her comments on what's happening to people in, in Minnesota, the direct impact, the direct adverse impact of this shutdown on their lives. We've all seen it. We've all experienced it. I'll be referring to specific testimony from people who wrote me letters, but let me just highlight one experience I had the other day at a, at a food bank in central Pennsylvania, right, uh, right uh, just miles from uh, our state capital, a food bank that serves some 27 of our 67 counties. And I was uh, talking about how this shutdown could end, that the president wanted the shutdown, he got the shutdown, but he could also end it. But prior to the, uh, prior to the discussion we had, behind us was a table where they had uh, a whole, uh, an entire table full of food items that that food bank and others in that region of Pennsylvania were delivering to federal workers, especially TSA agents who cannot afford food because they're working but not being paid. Hard to comprehend that. Hard to comprehend that so many veterans around the country who are once again serving their country, serving in the government as they served uh, in combat or in the military, serving again yet being left out in the cold, so to speak, sometimes literally, but obviously left out when they don't have a paycheck. So this is real life. We debate bills and, and uh, budgets and appropriations here in Washington. We have uh, debates on the floor and debates and discussions in the hallways. But for these folks, this is real life. I'll just point to maybe five examples in Pennsylvania. Adams County, which is um, in the southernmost part of our state, where Gettysburg is, just on the Maryland border but not a big county by population. Here's what one individual said, talking about uh, marrying, the, the, this individual's married to a federal worker. And I will just quote her uh, in part. She said, and I quote, we are expecting our first child this summer. And prior to December 22nd, we're excited about the future and potential of 2019. Now we are anxious sad and angry, not knowing where money, where money will come from to buy necessities for this child, let alone medical expenses related to birth and daycare. She goes on to say later in the letter, we are now in real and serious danger of losing our home and our vehicles. We will soon have to choose between buying groceries or paying for the electric bill. And she goes on from there. One Pennsylvanian in Adams County. Here's one from Cambria County, the county where Johnson is in the southwestern part of our state. This individual said, my husband is a federal employee who has been furloughed. She goes on to say, we have a son in elementary school. It's about time for spring sports signups, but we don't know how we're going to pay, for, uh, pay our bills and, or buy groceries. It's our son's birthday in less than two weeks. We canceled, canceled his birthday party to save some money. Cambria County, Pennsylvania. The third one I'll highlight is from Delaware County, one of the big suburban Philadelphia counties, big population county. Here's in part what this individual said. My in-laws are selling their home and cannot go to settlement because the FHA will not close a mortgage for the buyer. That's among several things they said. In the interest of time, I won't read all of it. But that's, we hear those stories all the time of people not being able to complete the work on a mortgage uh, because of the impact on, on the FHA. Here's Montgomery County. A, also a suburban Philadelphia County. This individual said, I am a law enforcement park ranger for the National Park Service. I'm the sole provider for a family of four to include two young children. Not knowing when I will get paid again is putting undue stress on the entire family.